Good morning. Welcome to the meeting. This is the regular meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods Village, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. This is Tuesday, February 5th, 2018. Leading us in, what did I say 2018? Yes. Oh, it comes so fast, 2019, here we go. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance will be Director Matson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Acknowledging the media, we know TV is on, and there we are in the back, the globe. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, Bert Moldau is back with us today. We're all so happy to have him back. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, approval of the agenda. So moved. So moved. All those in favor? Thank you. Approval of the minutes of the last meeting, January. Do I have a motion? Diane, second. Approval of the minutes, Don, thank you. All those in favor? Thank you, unanimous. We are now on to report of the chair. I have the pleasure of introducing our new CEO. This is his second day on the job. He just started yesterday and we've got him in the hot seat right away. And I have the pleasure of beginning with a little short introduction for him and then he will give us some more information when he uh, presents the CEO report. Anyway, welcome Jeff Parker. He's so well experienced in so many of the services that we provide here in the village to our residents. We were looking, when we were looking for a CEO, one of the things that we wanted to make sure was in place, that we would continue the legacy left to us by our former CEO, which is the exceptional team of senior management and the way they work so well together under the leadership of the CEO and we found that leadership in Jeff. It's, it was essential that we find that complement to the leadership to help us to continue and expand and improve the services to the residents of Laguna Woods Village. Jeff Parker holds a Master's of Public Administration from Cal State University, Long Beach, as well as his bachelor's degree is from UC Santa Barbara. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Then continuing my chair's remarks, I need to say that there are many celebrations in this month of February. In fact, today is the first day of the Lunar New Year. So Happy New Year to all of our Asian friends. Laguna Woods is a village where we celebrate President's Day, Black History Month, and the Month of Love with Valentine's Day. It's a community where neighbors reach out to help each other. We demonstrate love and kindness toward each other in this community. The foundation of Laguna Woods Village has as their motto, neighbors helping neighbors. And in fact, that's really what happens on a, on a daily basis with our citizens reaching out to help our neighbors. So during this month of love and kindness, we would like to express a debt of gratitude to our citizens who are such good neighbors and make this such a wonderful place in which to live. So today, I left my raincoat in the car. I'm hoping that we're coming to the end of this group of storms that we've been in. And I would just like to just reflect and thank 
Chief Moy and the security team, and COO Siobhan Foster and the management team, and the resident services team, as they were, as we were cuddled in our houses trying to keep dry, they monitored and addressed the storm damage and the concerns in the community, responded to telephone calls from citizens in need. They were there for us throughout this storm season. And thank you to our professional VMS staff for your truly diligent work. Thank you so much. And that's the report of the chair for today. And Next, we will have an update from our VMS director, Lucy Scheinman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You all want to know what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll try and tell you as much as I can. Uh, we. Part of our methodology in trying to keep everything under control and moving and follow our strategic plan and our goals that we set for ourselves with the help of the uh, directors of the management group, we had five goals that we set in the beginning three years ago. And you may or may not remember what they were, but the number one goal was to provide exemplary customer service. Remember that? Then we wanted to facilitate efficient operations. I think you may have seen some improvement in that area. Provide for a safe community. How are we doing? Become an employer of choice. This has become a toughie and provide transparent communication. During January, so far, or no, it includes, I think, five meetings for us in January, which is an unusually large number. We had presentations from two department heads. One was Betty Parker, who gave us a financial services update, which was pretty, pretty brief, pretty to the point, their deadline is March because that's when we start on the new budget, remember? <laughs> budget for 2020. We're hardly even in 2019. Anyway, the main thing that's happening that I think you'd love to know about in, in financial services is that the there will be the ability to use a credit card to make payments for regular monthly at a 3% tax on your credit card. In other words, like many uh, providers, we're not giving it to you for free on that. But resident services, when you have something where someone has to come and fix something, that can be put on at no additional cost. So that, I think, is in a vast improvement. It will also improve our ability to collect. In other words, when you're billed a month later for something that was now fixed, the uh, tendency had been in the past that, well, maybe I don't have to pay that right now. And that has caused quite a bit of uh, consternation. So now your, your repairs can be put on a credit card with no additional cost. There's been a new deal made with Southern California Edison about the solar system, and, and I don't quite understand all of that, but the bottom line is they have worked with SCE and they have gone from an average of 190 invoices per month to nine by working and consolidating and becoming more efficient in that area. The United went from an average of 190 invoices per month to nine. Third went from 430 invoices per month to 56, and GRF down to three. 
So this is a vast improvement, as you can see. Uh, the automation of golf inventory was a complete success. Instead of doing the old hand count, they used handheld scanners, and they got it done in you know like one day instead of a week. So it was it was very good inventory. Landscape is still going through some problems with how they allocate their time of doing any particular thing, and it's. Uh, changing the way of reporting their hours of work and whether United pays or GRF pays or third pays because that tree is belongs to one and that one belongs to the other and this one belongs to a third. So they're, they're getting that straightened out and that will be much more accurate as to who, who's getting the work done and who isn't. And then the not so good news Salary, salary analysis for employee retention. They finished making the analysis and they have used the information to get a more favorable uh, contract for the union, which is great news. In the future, the financial section is going to improve on their in, internal amount, internal uh, processes and, their, and the internal controls. That's their goal. Now, the other report we had this month was from Eileen Pollan in public relations. And if you've been here a number of years, you will know there's a difference in the communication, the methods of communication, the quality of the communication, the publicity of all kinds has just, she's done miracles in her period of time of being here. And she made a great big beautiful presentation. Uh, it's very detailed. Someday, we're hoping that's going to be on YouTube so that everybody can watch it because it's very worthwhile. Uh, remember the new website, Laguna Woods Village? And it has what they call portals. That's ways that you can utilize it. There's a way to use it in order to get to uh, Dwelling Live to register your guests get somebody through the gate, uh, and all this. This is, this is all part of what our employees have been doing to make it better and quicker and cheaper. And besides, they're all real nice people. Uh, we, there isn't much more I can say. You, I hope you are all aware of what a wonderful staff we have. Uh, our job as a board for VMS is to help and protect our staff. We're not on your side, we're on our own side, but we're the buffer between. We want everybody to get the service they want and the uh, relationships, the, the uh, appreciation for who, who we as residents are and Yet, we have to stick up for them, too. Remember, these people are just people like you are. And we want to get along. We want to be as helpful as possible as employees. However, we also have to get our work done. And we've run into some amount of difficulty with accomplishing the things that need to be done because of interruptions or micromanaging, and we want to get away from that. So there have been some steps taken that will be evident soon. Uh, because of the uncooperative 
methodology of some people. We have decided that we would close off the second floor to all but authorized people. Authorized people will get a bag, and on the back it has an entry key, like in a hotel. You <coughs> wave it and you get in. So this will keep out people that aren't supposed to be running around the second floor. Uh, we're hoping this will work. This will allow our new CEO to get something done besides <laughs> socialize with people. Yes, he needs to meet and greet and get to know people. However, he also might have some other work he has to get done, which we're paying for. <laughs> anyway, that's enough about VMS. It's a pleasure to be on a, a board, any board, because I love helping the universe of Laguna Woods Village. But I, I feel that the position that I'm in at the moment and the rest of my board is where we can see both sides. We've seen how it is when you're in a mutual and you want to get something done and they're not doing it. <clears throat> However, we also see it from the side of the poor guy upstairs who's saying, get these people out of here. I can't get anything done. So we've reached a compromise. I hope it works. And welcome to our new CEO, Jeff Parker. Thank you, Lucy. And now a um, report from Jeff Parker, CEO. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, the president said, second day on the job. So uh, just getting my feet wet and trying to learn uh, where things are and uh, paperwork process. But um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of um, uh, uh, what I think is a very outstanding organization and was referred to earlier about the outstanding leadership and management that we have um, in this organization. And so um, obviously from my style of management, I hope that I can just facilitate their excellence and um, pat, you know, create a path for them to achieve better and, and more things for this organization and for all of the mutuals um, because that's what we're here for. Um, just a little bit of background, uh, um, Beth asked me to update you, um, city, in city government for 35 years before coming here, um, 27 as a city manager in various cities in primarily Southern California, um, Walnut and Claremont up in the uh, San Gabriel Valley, um, was there for 10 years and six years and then most recently, city manager in Tustin for the last seven years, just down the road. Um, as a as a city manager and in this business for that long, I think I have um, prided myself and I think our organizations that um, those five principles and goals that were, were talked about earlier are um, just coincide with how I see um, good management occurring. Um, having empathy, having the working relationship with individuals um, is critical, um, being open about that, um, being um, financially sustainable in everything that we do is important. Um, I think um, creating an environment in which uh, the employees can grow and succeed, probably one of the things I focused probably more than anything in my career, um, and I appreciate Having city councils in the past, I believe that grooming new people and having people grow um, is very important. Uh, I um, love management. I love working with people. Um, so when this opportunity came open, um, it fit where I wanted to finish my career. So um, I hope I um, accomplish the goal that I have always um, set for myself when I go to a new organization, and that is I leave it in a better place than when I got here. And if I can do that, then I think we'll all be happy with the results. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And Siobhan, thank you. I would like to give the uh, CEO's update this morning. Honorable 
President, members of the board, the Gate Security Project is officially underway. It started yesterday at Gates 2 and 8. Gate 2 is in United and Gate 8 is in Third Mutual. This will install control gate access equipment, cameras, and other security measures. And this is the first phase of several to come. Uh, the systems are going to be installed at Gates 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, and 14. Construction hours for gates 2 and 8 are 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturdays. During gate 2 construction, gates 1 and 3 will be open 24-7. Gate 2 pedestrian access will be available only from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Gate 4 exit only will have extended hours from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And eastbound bus routes 1E, 2E, and 3E will return via gate 1. And then during gate 8 construction, gate 7 and 10 will be open 24 hours. Gate 8 pedestrian access and golf cart access will be from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. And bus routes will not be impacted. Maps are available at all gate houses and resident services if you need a little help finding your uh, new route because of the construction. President Perrick uh, captured the essence of our storm response this weekend very, very well. Um, we had all hands on deck Saturday and Sunday. So I want to extend my deepest appreciation to our staff for answering the telephones and resident services and security, and then all of our field personnel who helped out with clearing storm drains, addressing leaks, tree branches down, and so forth. We also had contractors on hand for roofing repairs and moisture intrusion. So it was an all, all hands effort, and I do want to express our appreciation to our staff members. Fortunately, the rain is forecasted to end today. But as a reminder, if you need assistance during uh, the week, please call resident services from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, and they can be reached at 949. 597-4600, and if you need help after business hours, please call security at 949-580-1400, and of course, 911 in an emergency. I would like to announce that the 2019 Dog Licensing and Vaccination Day, sponsored by Laguna Woods Dog Club, is this Thursday, February 7th, in Clubhouse One, in the main lounge. Vaccination services will be available from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Licensed services from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And as a reminder, residents are required to have a current dog license and rabies vaccination for January 1st through December 31st, 2019. For more information, you can contact the Laguna Woods Dog Club at 949-855-1938. And just a reminder that yesterday, new security measures were, were implemented in the uh, community center. This is to enhance the safety of our visitors, employees, and board members and advisors. On the first floor, there will be no change in the procedures for residents visiting manor alterations or resident services. They'll register at the kiosk like they have always done at the lobby, uh, at the lobby concierge desk. Access to recreation services, social services, the boardroom, and meeting rooms remain open to everyone. And then visitors to the second floor, compliance, and village television, please should check in at the concierge desk. Access to all the computer rooms and clubs on the third floor, as well as the table tennis room, remain open at all times. Thank you very much. That's my update this morning. Thank you, Siobhan. Appreciate that. It's now time for open forum. And at this time, the speakers may address the board of directors regarding items not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board of directors of the Golden Rain Foundation. There's a maximum time limit of three minutes per speaker, and a speaker may only address the board once during this period. The board reserves the right to limit the total amount of time allotted to the open forum. We have someone. Chris Collins. Welcome, Chris. Good morning. Chris Collins, 3306Q. 
Um, I'm here again uh, for another update on the work of the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village on behalf of residents experiencing temporary financial crisis. Here's a question, buying food or filling a prescription? No village res resident should have to choose between filling a prescription and buying food. A partnership between the foundation and the South County Outreach Food Pantry helps those who are having trouble stretching their budgets to cover food needs throughout the month. With the help of Age Well Senior Services, the foundation provides transportation for qualified village residents to the South County Outreach Food Pantry the second Tuesday of every month where they can get one week's worth of perishable and non-perishable uh, food monthly. Some of the participants have also um, qualified to receive a senior box of non-perishable food. To become a part of this program, please contact Social Services at 949-597-4267 to determine eligibility. Residents can also go to the food pantry on their own, which is located at 7 Watney Suite B in Irvine. It's open from 9 a.m. to 3.30 on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, but only in the afternoons on Tuesdays from 12.30 to 3.30. Anyone interested should bring a photo ID, address ver verification such as a utility or phone bill, and verification of household income via a Social Security statement. The foundation also continues other programs to meet the nutrition and food needs of residents. Through social services, senior citizens in need can obtain grocery cards to purchase food at local supermarkets. The foundation also provides monthly funding to the Meals on Wheels program to feed, to feed village residents. Each month, between 150 and 175 residents receive such meals as a result of funding through the foundation. For Meals on Wheels, please, please call the Sylvester, Florence Sylvester Senior Center at 949-380-0155. And for other food programs, please contact Social Services at 949-268-2271. And for more information, you can also contact us at the foundation by email, which is the foundation. Um, at comline.com or by phone, which is 949-268-2246. Thank you very much. Ann Russell. Good morning, Ann. Good morning. Um, I'm Ann Russell, 3079A. I am back as a repeat on the uh, absence of the TV in Clubhouse One. Um, from, the, from our last meeting, I spent a week sitting at the sign-in table uh, having people sign the petition for the reinstatement of the TV. Uh, I have 1,144 signatures. Now, these are people that came to the lounge, okay? I didn't solicit as I did with the reinstatement of the coffee some time ago. What I found out, and I, as, <clears throat> excuse me, as each person came in, I asked them individually, did you see anybody fighting over the TV? One person out of this 1,000 plus. And he did see the one that it was, uh, the report was made on. And he was very, very upset about it. No one else that signed this petition saw anybody fighting. Now, I do have, and I will leave, if I may, the copies of an article from The Week magazine about the epidemic of loneliness and the health threats. Also, interestingly enough, in the bottom section of the article, it talks about one of the reasons for the shrieking about politics is that people do not find a community to discuss in a civil way. 
the numbers of the use, and you can check that with the audience, uh, with the office, the numbers of the use of that lounge have plummeted. People are not coming because the TV people have said, this is our living room. We come here to talk to people, to watch the TV, to play games, to do whatever. And I have, I have, I go there practically every day. I may be the only one there. You may not understand this, but the people of this community do. And that is, somebody said to me, this is like ripping the heart out of our community. This is where we meet friends. So I am asking you to please get it reinstated. Now, there are all kinds of rumors going around. There are all kinds of discontent about the way it was done. And we're, we're, one rumor is they're going to return it, but they're going, not going to let us watch the news. We're not children. The other rumor is that um, they're going to do something about the acoustics in there. We don't know. We would like to know what is the status of this program. We're not children. And I truly believe that we should be consulted about if you're going to do something in that room. There are a lot of things that are wrong with that room. It's badly designed for its use. But people want to put in what they think will make it a better place for all of us. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Elizabeth Romano. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. I want to thank you all again for uh, participating and supporting our community. I'm here as follow-up for the television uh, issue and requesting that you return it and work out something because it really does serve a great need in the community that's not being met. Uh, as you saw, there was over a 1,000 people that said this is important to me. Uh, I would like for you to can take into consideration that and return the television. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Freshly. Good morning, Catherine. Good, mo good morning. Um, I'm here to speak on an issue that really was just being brought up and that's the closing of the second floor and the moving of all the committee meetings from the boards down to the first floor. The reason I'm concerned is because those first floor meeting rooms are used by clubs. In fact, I'm president of the Foreign Policy Association. And when you are having then board committee meetings on the first floor, you're preventing clubs from using those rooms. And we've been closing rooms throughout the community. If you recall, Clubhouse 5, we put a gym in one of the meeting rooms. In Clubhouse uh, 7, uh, or not 7, but in Clubhouse uh, 1, there's been no change. But Clubhouse 3, they're looking at the Performing Arts Center and eliminating a meeting room there to, bring, to make it a small theater. I don't object to those things. But I think before we make a decision that affects the clubs, because I think we all agree, this community with 250 clubs is one of the things that is the attractiveness of this community. If there's a security issue, from what I understand, was as I've heard the discussion today, I think there needs to be a better way of handling it so that board committees do meet on the second floor. You got three meeting rooms up there, and when you shut down the second floor, so that committee meetings are on the first floor because they're required by law to be open and to allow access by residents, then you eliminate then the opportunity for clubs. I don't know whether you went to recreation and got a listing, but my guess is there must be 20 clubs that would be affected by not having those, the Elm Room and the Pine Room available. You know, a couple years ago when we put the when we put the uh, the fitness center in, we eliminated the redwood room, which had two rooms right there. So we've been eliminating rooms, and now we got 
you know, we, we took away the one room over in the corner for, uh, you know, for approval of, of, of my, I forget the term, modifications, but, you know. So we're doing things that I agree may be right for us, but I think we need to re-examine this one issue when it comes to shutting down the second floor and eliminating meeting rooms on the first floor just for the convenience or for what we perceive to be increased security. Thank you. Thank you. Monica Hobson. Good morning, Monica. Good morning. Monica Hobson, 3300B. Uh, I want to bring the uh, $25 fee to your attention for the RFID stickers. I have learned there is no policy in place. Uh, former CEO and staff has implemented this, and, but there's no policy in place. And uh, in some communication with staff, I was confirmed that there is no requirement of having a sticker. Now, can you imagine when the new gate arms come in and nobody wants, has a sticker and uh, the pile up? I mean, that's ludicrous. Besides, uh, there is a, a civil code in place and which is in violation. You cannot charge an excessive fee and $25 is excessive. So I'd like you to revisit that, please. Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Landry. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Michael Landry, 693B. I want to talk trash today. Can we talk trash? Uh, the uh, recycling situation is, um, I guess, confusing to me and possibly a little irritating. Uh, we used to have uh, bins uh, away from our units right on the uh, Via Verde where we could bring our, our recyclables, glass, paper, and plastic. So then we went to the more um, accessible bin, which we're having to pay more money for. Plus, if there's an ort, that's a crossword word, ort, of, tra of, a, of a not uh, recyclable materials, the whole bin is tossed into the regular garbage, and we get a fine, I understand, or we uh, some kind of a fee because there's food stuff in the thing. Um, why? We're paying, we're paying more for it, as, as, as I said, and then we get the fine. I find that a little irritating, and can we address it somehow to go back? I don't, I don't, I don't want to go back on progress, but I think we were probably getting money for our recyclables when we were taking it to the, um, to the open bins there. And now it seems to be costing us more. Um, and my, my second point is, when am I going to get my gate for lot B RVs? I've been promised it for some, some we have been promised it for some months. So trash and RV gate. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Manuel Armendariz. Good morning, Manuel. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome the new general manager. Good luck. And I want, also want to acknowledge all the hard work that Siobhan has been doing. I think she deserves a big hand for her performance. Uh, what I came to talk about, uh, I must apologize, I'm probably a little late, but in December, I noticed that an approval was made by this board to have a traffic uh, engineer hired because of the concern of some of the problems along uh, uh, Calle Aragon as you come in from gate one and turn left from Avenida Sevilla. And I had some thoughts on that, and I, again, I apologize for not coming sooner, but the thought that hit me was as you turn left from Avenida Sevilla onto Calle Aragon, right on the right-hand side on the slope, there's a sign that says 25 miles per hour speed limit. And my suggestion is that before we spend the money on an engineer, that we replace that with another sign that says uh, 20, uh, 15 mile per hour on curve. 
And that continues that way all the way to get past the slope and past, uh, I think it's cul-de-sac 30, going into the units there, and not, and then move that 25 mile per hour sign past that point somewhere because of what I've read is that there's concern about safety to pedestrians and parked cars in that area. Same thing coming back towards Clubhouse One on Calle Aragon, uh, just before you come to the parking lot where the library is, you know, some far, some place in there, put the same sign again, uh, 15 mile per hour uh, on curve. And the only question I had was that I was thinking that maybe you wouldn't put any other signs on the right hand side because the curve continues on past the entry to Clubhouse One. And then you got, you got the intersection there at that point. So maybe just put a sign up that says end of curb right near the intersection because you don't want any people speeding up from 15 to 25, you know, when they're coming to the intersection. So that's my recommendation there. I think that might work. And uh, in reading the report, I, I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Moy that uh, we don't want speed bumps. There's a lot of areas throughout the community that have curves and, uh, cur and uh, there's a worse one up there as you're coming out into uh, from gate two that actually goes downhill. But apparently nobody seems to have noticed any problems there. So uh, I'm worried that the uh, traffic engineer might come up with the suggestion of speed bumps because they do work. But we don't want speed bumps, in my opinion, throughout the community. They'll wreck your car. And I don't, we just have bad drivers in, in the village, you know, let's face it. Um, <laughs> The other thing I was going to comment, and I hadn't intended to do this, but uh, Catherine brought it up. We have a plan to uh, revise the third floor minute. for uh, call center and for security. And when I first heard about that, I was not in favor of that because all of a sudden we already have a, a parking problem here in this. So uh, if you move security there, that's just going to add to it. Uh, maybe you reconfigure that so it's used for communications, communication center and part of the administrative staff of security, but leave security over there where they are now. Um, the other thing is, I also agree we ought to replace that TV in the coffee room next to Clubhouse One. Really, that, that was a mistake, removing that. Thank uh, you, Manny. That's all my comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Doug Gibson. Good morning, Doug. On the way to the gym, so excuse my casual attire. But anyway, a couple of things. Um, representing Gate 11 on it, uh, we've had uh, a couple inquiries with new residents. We had the area was uh, marked or whatever, the cracks in the street were filled on in. And then the question has come up to me, and I haven't been able to answer it. Are we due to be slurried later in the year, filled on in? Uh, the cracks, of course, are accentuated because of the filling on in. But I just want to, if somebody can let me know, but I'll convey it to a couple of the new neighbors. Um, working kind of with the landscape and maintenance crews of G or committees of GRF, uh, the, we're making great progress on the West Creek area. So that's been a very nice situation working with Jim and John. Um, representing the RV wheelers, there's. Uh, most of you were involved with a lot of the upgrades that were took place in lots A and lot B last year. And, then, and also in representing them, um, the RV wheelers are working closely with all of the committees as best we can to keep that looking nice. And I understand last year that through GRF or somebody was now beginning to work closely with the real estate agents. And the RV lots really now are an important ingredient of this community. And if there is a committee meeting or a, a management meeting with the uh, real estate people here, which I think probably has been very important, I'm wondering if the RB wheelers can come on in and make a little bit of a sales pitch or whatever you want to call it concerning how the RV uh, lots play, play an important part of this community. And that's just some feedback. I am. I'm not sure if that exists anymore, but if it does, then we'd like an opportunity to participate in it. Uh, I'm headed to the gym, so I'll look for on TV any responses to these inquiries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Franklin Smith. Oh, 
Welcome, Franklin. It's been a long time. Good it to see you. It has been a little while, hasn't Good it? Good to see you. Franklin Smith, 5369 3D. Uh, good to see you all, because all of you have been here quite a long time. Most of you have been here quite a long time. And congratulations to our new uh, CEO. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, say that I support Kathleen Freshley's motion. You know, um, I'm security conscious, but you know, we've been here a long time. The more security uh, that we put out there, the less that we have um, as far as freedom is concerned. I like transparency, as many of you know. Now, I'd like to address the issue of the projection system in Clubhouse 5. Um, back in 2011, I wrote, last year I attended a Monday night football broadcast at Clubhouse 5 and was shocked at the Mickey Mouse projection system being used. It was fuzzy, dark, low definition, and the colors were washed out due to the lack of illumination. Now, I addressed that to this board. I've talked to media, and I talked directly to recreation about the issues with that old projector. And I did research and uh, looked at many, many different projection systems and came up with a projector um, directly dealing with uh, Sanyo, who built that projection system, and, uh, and found one that was high def, had twice the illumination, and we could use the same lens, which is very expensive, for $5,000. Now, um, I was talking to Recreation, and they were looking around, and their consultant told them to put in a double unit in the ceiling there. And they asked me what I thought about it. And I said, it's a really bad idea. I said, you have alignment problems. Uh, you have twice the electronics to deal with. And, um, uh, and it's, it's too much at that period of time when the technology was evolving. And the unit that I came up with was $5,000, and this two units was going to be $40,000, and that's what it cost. Now, since they installed that, there has never been more than one projector working. The other one has been in some case, uh, some sort of malfunction, you know, since the beginning, uh, eight years ago. You know, and I went to the game and, uh, last Sunday, and it was as bad as it was 11 years ago with the old unit. And it... You know, it's just unbelievable that we could spend $40,000 instead of the $5,000, you know, for a single projector, um, you know, that I proposed back in 2011. And, you know, the, it's, I walked out after the first quarter. I hadn't been going to games. And I'm, I'm probably never go again because it's, there was a whole lot of people there. It was packed and, uh, and I couldn't see the game. You know, I went home and turned on my uh, four, uh, 4K TV set that's just massive, and I could see the game. You know, I mean, it's, it's night and day, and most of the people, if not, I mean, all the people in that room had high-definition TV sets that totally blows away what's in there. Clubhouse 2 has a good projection system. Thank you. Clubhouse 5 has garbage. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Maxine McIntosh. Good morning, Maxine. Good morning, all of you lovely people. I would like to add my congratulations to Mr. Parker. Welcome aboard. And uh, I recall the outgoing CEO, Brad Hudson, <clears throat> who was responsible for many good improvements during his service here, saying that the first year was tough. So I imagine in some ways your first year will be tough. You might have to anticipate that. Um, but many of the people at the supervisory levels were new. The ones with the experience and the protocols of the village and the knowledge of what had gone on for 20 years left. So I'm hoping now you have more experienced supervisors and you'll get very good support. Welcome. I'd like to say that I agree with Catherine on the uh, problem when you have to displace uh, groups meeting 15 times a week here in the community center upstairs. We know we don't have an abundance of open rooms. However, I did uh, on my own 
try to find out the reason for closing off the second floor. And I just want to assure the community that it's nothing personal from the boards. They're not trying to take away openness or control. Uh, they're not trying to box us in. There really were, I can say this because I got it second and third hand, I didn't go to staff, that there were serious altercations upstairs, and this is the best way to handle it now. Uh, when I was on the United Board some years ago, we had to do that. We had to close, and I voted for it. We had to close the upstairs for about a year. And then, of course, it opened again when things subsided and, and mellowed out. So uh, I just don't want anybody to think it's an attack on any mem uh, the majority of the members of this community in any way. Um, let's see. I'm very grateful to this GR board for beginning all the work necessary to install the traffic control arms at gate two and at gate eight. I've watched how well these gates work, uh, the arms work at gates five and six, and I was surprised to find out just day before yesterday, two more people in our community who never drove through that, those gates, five and six. They don't know how easy it is and how smooth it is. I was surprised. I could hardly wait till I could test them both out. So I hope everybody will get out and take a drive through part of the community and see how well it works. Because I remember up until this program for the arms, the raising arms at the gates, began uh, about oh, five years ago. People were at this rostrum all the time complaining about lack of security at our gates. We had complaint after complaint after complaint. This is a long range program and it's going to solve most of that. I hope people get out and try it and thank you very much for overseeing that. Thank you, Maxine. John Frankel. Good morning. Uh, John, a quick question regarding gate access. Uh, I raised this question at the community uh, uh, access meeting uh, last month, and, I, and Chief Moore was unable to give me a hundred percent answer. It was still pending, but I understand where access is closed for six weeks. But my question is, what about departures? Is it possible? Maybe this goes to you, Jim. Is it possible to have the, have the departures open uh, during that six-week period, or at least not closed for all six weeks? Cash Akrakar. Good morning, everybody. What an, what an astute and alert team of people here. And welcome, Mr. Parker. Uh, we have a great community, and you'll be very happy to be here and improve it further. And I'm proud of that, I'm sure. Basically, what I want to say is about the TV in Clubhouse One. I left in December, and when I came back, I find that the room where I generally go for a cup of coffee in the morning, so quiet and no noise and no people. Here we, are, we have a community, people are seniors, they want to mingle, mix, and be there, present, and assemble and spend time together. I think Anne is absolutely right. We have 1,000 people, I think she collected signatures. We should put that TV back on. I find that the incident that caused all this was way back when, and all of a sudden, this was removed from the picture. This is not fair. I think we should give them the TV back, maybe control so that only a certain channel can be put, or maybe control the volume so that there is no disturbance created by the TV. Please look into it and please help the community get together and enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks, Cash. That concludes the speakers. Thank you, one and all. And so now responses. Who would like to respond here? Pat's hands up first there. Uh, I'd like to respond to the two ladies and Cash and everybody who um, talked about the drop in lounge. I think that I c I'm going back to when I was president of United and we had petitions presented to us. I think that the process that you're using is not accurate to demand 
things be done. And I think you have to actually present that petition, if my memory serves me right, present the petition to the president and then say you want to vote. Well, obviously, we, we don't want to vote on this because it would cost us about $100,000 to send out petitions to everybody. So I think we need to come up with another solution because um, I certainly agree that uh, you should have the TV in the lounge. And then I would like to address the uh, situation that Catherine brought up. And um, I thought the GRF and the CAC committee was supposed to be in charge of the usage of the administration building. And yet, I don't think we've had a vote on such a thing. I don't remember it in any case if we did. So um, I think that the responsibility for who's using what in this building comes down to GRF and certainly the CAC committee. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, OK, we'll respond to that. Um, yes. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to respond to Ann Russell and Dr. Elizabeth Roma and also Cash Akrakar. Now, Ann Russell and Dr. Elizabeth Roma were at the CAC meeting, which we had, and we have our next one on March 14th at 1.30, which um, Brian Gruner, the Recreation Department Director, will be giving us his report on his findings. He is studying this right now. We went over this and elaborated um, exactly. We know what this means, but we also need to do it in such a way that uh, what's best for the community and uh, for the enjoyment of everybody in the clubhouse lounge. So they're studying it right now, and they will look and give us their report on the next CAC meeting, which is Thursday, March 14th at 1.30. And we did mention it there at the last committee meeting, so uh, please attend. All right? And as far, uh, that's it. OK, thank you. Thank you. Judith. I'd like to um, pick up where Manny left off, or Director Armandeus. He was talking about the, he called the engineer for m and that we've hired as a consultant. And I've been give, getting a lot of calls because a lot of people don't realize I'm no longer an m and So I've been sending them to Ray Gross. I hope that's been OK, Ray. Uh, and I think the question I've been getting is, uh, do you plan on and when is the residents going to be able to meet with a consultant the new consultant we hired for m and are they going to be able to have their input with him? And, yeah. So, okay, right. no, that has to do with responding to Manny. Yes. Thank you. Uh, regarding the, the gentleman <clears throat> that spoke to, about the signs from 25 to 15, it's a wonderful idea. However, nobody pays attention to him. They don't even consider stopping or slowing down to 15 miles an hour. We have people that swear that they stop at stop signs, and we have pictures of them going through 25 to 30 miles an hour. So it's a good idea. However, it's just not going to happen at this point in time. We'll have to come up with some other thing to do. I agree with you. The bumps are not the idea, but we'll come up with something, perhaps, that will be of assistance. Thank you. I, I also saw the proposal that we would hire a traffic engineer. And I was a little stunned by that because I believe if we went to the internet and, and just asked Google, what are the means by which we can control the speed of traffic, we would come up with a whole list of recommendations. And I think you know a traffic engineer isn't going to do much more for us than that but make one recommendation. I think we could do just as well without hiring a consultant. That's my opinion. Uh, the other thing is I think that Catherine Freshly raises an outstanding point that these meetings that we hold on the second floor are open meetings. Okay, residents are invited. We encourage them to come to these committee meetings. And this is going to make it extremely difficult. So I think we have to look at another way of doing this. Thank you. Yes, Jim. John on the partial gate. Uh, opening, I'll look into that. And also, Doug, on the slurry, I'll get you the information for that. Thank you. Okay, Annette. 
Okay, this is on Franklin Smith about the projection system in Clubhouse 5. Um, I wasn't there for Super Bowl Sunday, but I have been there uh, watching the Chiefs during this football season. And uh, while it, it is a little grainy because the projection screen is so large, um, I found it, uh, I didn't come away thinking it wasn't a great place to meet friends and have a, have a hot dog and free chips and popcorn. So for me, that was fine. Now, I, I'm not nearly as technical as you are, and I'm sure that uh, we can bring that up, and I'll bring that up to recreation and have them take a look at it. Okay? That's the best I can do for that one. The other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was, uh, I, having been the, uh, worked on security last year about Michael Landry, about the recyclable materials, uh, this is uh, the, basically in the environment, the trash. We really have to be careful because it's not only in this community. This is a big deal in the state of California, in every community. And we have to really work on things. We have composting now. And we really have to be careful. If we're not supposed to be putting trash in the trash bins, then we have to make sure that we just put it in the regular or recycle bins, we have to make sure we throw trash where it should be. We're very fortunate in this community that uh, we can throw plastic in recyclables because the uh, waste management is high tech enough that they can, through their machines, take out the plastic and stuff. So I know it's, it is a problem and it's a problem every community faces. I was just up in San Francisco um, and watching the kids up, my family up there, San Francisco, the way we have one of those blue bins that we wheel out to the street, for their trash now, they have a dummy half of it, so it's only half now, and that is for your trash. Everything else then has a compost bucket, a recyclable bucket, and everything else. I mean, it is amazing what they're expecting people to do. I felt like I almost needed a PhD to throw out the trash up there. Um, so all I'm saying is changes are coming, and we have to adhere to them for everyone because there's just an overcrowding. And we just have to do it. That's all I can say. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Diane. A couple of things. One is I, th I think I, I got the impression you're talking about two different things with the mobility because this isn't the person that's going to come and talk about the bus system. This is just an engineer that's going to talk about uh, that they're going to have uh, give us some ideas about what we could do um, that would not include stop signs or uh, speed bumps. We were just looking for maybe some striping. It wasn't that expensive, and we felt that it was better to hire an expert than it was to uh, put everyone's safety to, to rely on, on just what we find on the internet. So, And the other is, uh, there was a mention made that one of the rooms is closing in the Performing Arts Center. The Dining Room One is, is closing and becoming a dedicated small theater. And I just want to assure people that is not true. That, that isn't the plan. Um, there are perhaps some, uh, maybe we're going to be able to have some AV equipment upgrades or some soundproofing upgrades in that room. But in no way is there a plan to make that into just a dedicated small theater. Um, and um, also, uh, the discussion about the RFIDs. Um, you, it's true that you do not have to have an RFID. Um, it is true that we have a policy. I don't know why there seems to be no policy, but we have a policy. And it, uh, we aren't charging an exorbitant amount because we are charging what it costs us. They are just expensive. They're much more expensive than the little uh, sticker that went on the window. That's how much they are. So that, that, we're just passing the cost on. And that's it. Thank you. And Anne. OK, um, this is on the RFID policy. Um, Several years ago, there was a free RFIDs for everyone. And, you know, it was, they spent twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to get this to roll out to the whole community. I don't know if you were a member then or not. And then some people decided to opt out of it. And now they have to pay $25 to get it. There is, it's not, there is a policy. However, it's not mandatory right now. It will be mandatory once all the gates are in for people to have those. Well, I would say it should, I take, I roll that back. It's not going to be mandatory because if you're a resident here and you don't want to pay the $25, I think it behooves you to pay it, you're going to have to walk, you're going to have to drive up to where the um, ambassador is and show your ID card every time you come in and out of the community. 
And once all the gates are, I think that, you know, as much as all of us use the different gatehouses, clubhouses, and everything else, and flit about the community, I think that that is a uh, very inefficient way to get about the community when $25 assures you you can get across this community smoothly year after year after year. So that is, there is a policy for it. Um, there is, you know, as I said, it's not mandatory that you have it. However, it is recommended. That's all I can say on that. Go ahead, Siobhan. Thank you. I'd like to address the question of Lot B, uh, the RV gate at Lot B. This is a project scheduled for calendar year 2019. So uh, it's currently being reviewed and will be constructed this year. Thank you. Anybody else? Diane. Did you also want to address the idea of keeping the gates open for departures? I believe Director Matson was going to report back on that, but I don't okay. think it is feasible. Okay. Anybody else? Sorry. Okay, one more, Annette. Okay, I will check with uh, Brian Gruner and with Shoban about the, uh, the impact of closing uh, the second floor, but I think it's a good system, and I think we're going to be using the boardrooms more, and we've got other rooms for clubs. It's just going to be a little bit more creative. It'll just make people get a little bit, um, it's just change. And we had to do that to make people, our employees are being paid by us to be efficient and effective and not for certain board directors to sit up there and visit with them and socialize. And we need to also plus, um, plus have them Harassed. So I think we need to protect them, and we need to protect the community as a whole, and we need to protect you who pay assessments. Thank you. Yeah, last, last uh, traffic hearing, there was a little bit of a problem, uh, whereas we were supposed to have a specific room for the afternoon. We went over there, and there were five or six <coughs> ladies over there that were very, very upset with me because I happened to be the chair. We had no idea that this system had changed. In, in the past, what's happened to the afternoon session goes to one of the smaller rooms because they have generally another meeting here in the afternoon and just have two or three people here for traffic, they decided it would be better to go to smaller rooms. So that really is going to have to be looked into. We had to do a lot of running around to get straight out as to what we were going to be able to do for that afternoon session. I think like we're going to have to do some tweaks in the program and work on it. I'd, I'd see Siobhan going to the microphone. Go ahead. Director Gross, we have addressed that for future meetings. Thank you. Well, thank you. Anybody else? It's only day two. I would, I would like to just um, reiterate what Chris Collins mentioned. Um, the foundation has several different ways. If you, if you have difficulties getting food, the... She mentioned South County Outreach Food Pantry, and there's a bus that takes folks there once a week, Meals on Wheels, and Stater Brothers Food car Cards, different ways that, that we can help with food. The foundation can help, and you will find food cards if it's necessary. And where you go to get that help is our social services department. And if you need to ask about about a question, uh, if you have food concerns, you could also call the foundation number, which is 949-268-2246. Thank you. And Judith. I just meant to uh, add that on the, if you missed all those numbers or you can't remember them, an easy number to remember is Orange County has a number 211. And if you just call 211, that is a Orange County wide number for resources, which does include uh, food and help of all types. Thank you. Thank you, Judith, that's very important. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, that concludes that section. And we are now on the consent calendar. Do I have a motion? Yes, Pat. I move that we accept the ca consent calendar as it is. Second. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Yes. I wish to remove item A to add additional uh, advisor information to the committees. It's not on the existing list right now. 
to, okay. to say that again, Bert, what you want to do? make a motion that we remove item A from the consent calendar for further uh, discussion. I'd like to add advisors to the committees that I chair. And it's not on there. Uh, okay, I think it reoccurs often. Yeah, that, that happens often. And so if it, you want, wish to do that, just just see Whitney, and then it happens. Okay. It's okay. We don't have to do it now. Okay. All those in favor? Please use your screens to vote. Pardon? Oh, oh this one we're voting on the computer. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. It's unanimous. So now we are on unfinished business, and this, I believe, my friend Joan will be <coughs> reading each one, right? <laughs> She's working on it. <laughs> Resolution 9019 X, permanent elimination of fitness guest fees. Whereas the fitness guest fee was temporarily suspended during May through August of 2017 and 2018, and whereas the current fitness guest fee is $6 per person, and whereas the fitness guest fee revenue is projected to be approximately $1,868 for 2018, and whereas staff received positive feedback from residents and requests that the temporary suspension be made permanent, and whereas facility usage did not experience an increase in guest usage during the temporary suspension periods. Now, therefore, be it resolved February 5th, 2019, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves the permanent elimination of fitness guest fees and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of this corporation to carry out this resolution. I move that we approve this resolution. Uh, yeah, isn't um, the third whereas down, shouldn't that be for 2019? The projected amount is anticipated to be 1868. It says for 2018. Does that mean 2018 or should it be 2019? It should be 18. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sure you must have considered that we are losing 74,961 as a change that you are suggesting. Also, our equipment is for our people, not for guests of other people for free. What they are paying is for their use of our equipment. And eliminating $75,000 a year and the next one, another $45,000 uh, in those four months, is a lot of money. Are we sure we do not need that kind of hundred thousand dollars? We have money laying around. I'm not sure you under, the, the, on the second page, the attachment one, those are people, those aren't numbers. Those aren't dollar amounts. It, the dollar amount is very low. It's about $2,000, I think. That's all. Times six or times three. No, no, that's. That's all total. That's attendance. That's members. Uh, the other part of the, his comment that, yes, the equipment is for our residents, but I don't think he realizes how many residents have caregivers that have to go with them and go in there as a guest and or, or help them with their physical therapy, and that covers them as well. Yeah. Yeah, another consideration would be the administrative costs for keeping track of the income. And uh, that would probably be more expensive than the actual income. Thank you. 
I was just going to say I think that we have uh, uh, have got have received more positive feedback from people who brought in their guests and were happy that they were able to do that, um, as opposed to people complaining that that there were too many guests and that it was too busy. We have one speaker, Maxine McIntosh. things by all the boards and uh, they're told uh, this affects a small uh, portion of the community or this is an optional activity so the people involved should be carrying the expense and it shouldn't come out of our assessments <clears throat> and so forth. Well, you, it's uh, commented here that <clears throat> requests were made uh, to get rid of the charge. Well, of course, the people coming into the gym paying the charge would like to get rid of it. That, that to me is not a valid survey. Uh, I think if you surveyed the whole community, none of, nobody wants to send out a survey, but if you did on all kinds of issues and you said, how would you like to get rid of <clears throat> a couple thousand dollars income a year from, uh, for guest fees, for anything, it would be, you'd get a, a strong no. Um, why should the whole community pay for guests? And also, I don't think any account has been allowed here for wear and tear on the equipment, maintenance of the room, the restrooms and the equipment, and replacement of equipment. This is just the guest fee that's charged. And a simple guest fee every day from two of the fitness centers, I can't imagine that taking very much bookkeeping time, not like it would on a major item where there's different prices and different times of, of uh, different uh, kinds of maybe things for sale, like uh, golf equipment or something. This is straightforward, very simple. I hope you do not put this back on the community that you will handle any additional wear and tear by the guests because we don't want to charge the guest fee any longer. I hope you will keep the guest fee. Thank you. If we can buy into the amount of dollars that uh, we would be giving up, and you think about it, this comes to one cent per manor per month. And I think we can be a little much more a host to the people that come to this community and be willing to put up that one cent per month. Thank you. Sean Tempain. Hi. Uh, welcome, new. Uh, CEO, I'm a little confused. I've, I've been watching this subject for two or three months now, and I was against getting rid of the guest fees uh, on the basis of we're a shared community, um, but guests aren't part of the community. I think the idea of caregivers being allowed to come in with a resident makes perfect sense for no charge. I'm looking at the subject matter here, and and uh, Cash made a, I think Cash made a comment that this was seventy-four thousand dollars, and Diane appropriately said, "No, these are people, not money." But the top of the attachment says summer guest utilization comparison report. If that is true, then you have somewhere near seventy-five thousand guests a year over the course of the last three years. I'm assuming that's not true, because if it were true. And six dollars times seventy-five thousand dollars is a hell of a lot more than eighteen hundred dollars. So my question is: This is apples and oranges, I assume. But my problem is that we don't have the information of exactly how many guests are we letting in for nothing. This has been going on now for six months now. I think we've had this a uh, temporary abeyance of fees. My question is: How many guests did we have in that period? This doesn't show that. This purports to say we have 75,000 people in 2018 that came in as guests for nothing. That's what it says, though. It says guest fee utilization. It doesn't say total utilization, including guests. I'd like to see a little more specificity in the numbers to get us real data. 
and I'm not arguing the point that we only have $1,800 in guest fees. I do think it's fairly simple if you have to show your card when you go into these areas to use the equipment. If you're a guest, it isn't that more difficult to grab six bucks or swipe a card to pay for it. But I think this is probably settled law with this group already, but my issue is I'd like to see exactly what we're talking about rather than this information which seems to be in conflict with each other. If you just look at the two pages, four of six and five of six on agenda item 12A. Thanks. I would like to answer the question of number of guests that visited the facility. In 2017, it was 269 visitors, and our estimate for uh, 2018 is 200, um, excuse me, is 194 visitors. And the chart on the second page is the aggregate users, not the guests. So. Uh, Mary Stone. I have the uh, Golden Rain Foundation operating statement for 1231 to 2018, and the total actual guest fees for fitness that uh, was um, that they got in 2018 was $1,168, which is less than 200 guests. These are the actual figures from the 1231 as of, you know, for the whole year. So for 200 people, the, the actual uh, administration of picking up the, the money and all is just not worth the, the, the expense. Thanks, Mary. When you want the data, Mary's got it. <laughs> Thank you so much. OK, so um, all those in favor of the motion? Oops, we got it. <laughs> Thank you. It's unanimous. Moving on to point B under 12, entertain a motion to approve a resolution for permanent elimination of the aquatic guest fees. December was the initial notification, 30-day notification to comply with civil code. 4360 has been satisfied. And our secretary, Joan. Resolution 90-19-XX, permanent elimination of aquatic guest fees. Whereas the aquatic guest fee was temporarily suspended during May through August of 2017 and 2018, and whereas the current aquatic guest fee is $3 per person, and whereas the aquatic guest fee revenue is projected to be approximately $4,000 for 2018, and whereas the elimination of aquatic guest fees provides more efficient and effective operation at the pools, and whereas the elimination of aquatic guest fees prioritizes the health and safety of users, and whereas staff receive positive feedback from residents and request that the temporary suspension be made permanent, and whereas facility usage did not experience an increase in guest usage during the temporary suspension <coughs> periods. <coughs> Now, therefore, be it resolved, February 5th, 2019, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves the permanent elimination of aquatic guest fees, and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we approve this resolution. Second. Annette. Discussion? Mary? Mary Stone, 356C. 
Uh, I think when you look at the financial analysis on uh, page 3 of 6, 12B, it says revenue lost by permanently eliminating the pool guest fee is estimated at $4,000 annually. I think that's, that number is incorrect. If you look at the second paragraph under background in your uh, staff report, you will see that the annual revenue in 2016 was 13,534. So your, your loss of revenue is over $13,000. That's a little bit different than, you know, than what we were talking about in the fitness fees. So, uh, you know, uh, I really think this, you, you really need to understand that your loss of, your summer loss of revenue is over $9,500. That's, that's considerably more. Now, the problem is in uh, collecting the money, the lifeguards are, you know, distracted from watching the people in the pool. So that would probably offset, you know, the safety would probably offset that. But that's still a sizable chunk, and you better understand that it is, uh, you know, more than what is specified here. So I think that uh, you have to weigh the financial versus the safety issue here. Thank you. Thank you. Annette. OK, um, uh, w one more thing, since I have the numbers here. <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> the budget for pool fee guests, guests in 2018 was 10275 and the actual that was collected is 2,399. However, you have to understand, people don't usually swim off season. They usually swim in the summer, and that's when you have your greatest attendance. Thank you. OK, um, the reason, uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, they did suspend fees, too, in 2018 from May through August. There's a few things that have happened. And one of the things was in the past, they would allow children to swim in the pool starting at age four and then up through age 15. And now they allow infants to swim in the pool up through age 15. And that is at Clubhouse. Um, yeah, I've been there this summer, so I know what I mean. I know what I've seen and I know what I'm talking about. So basically, the reason toddlers, okay, toddlers. Um, the reason. <clears throat> that I for this, <clears throat> excuse me, is we have outsourced our lifeguards who are very young and, and the pools are busier, especially now at Clubhouse 5, or is it Clubhouse 6, the smaller pool? Six. Clubhouse 6, <clears throat> the smaller pool. It was really fun. There was a lot of families, a lot of really, it was just great stuff going on, but it's just far too busy for those lifeguards to collect money, keep track of all that, and keep track of all the action going on in the pools. And as far as our own personal liability goes, it's an issue for me of safety. I don't want to see somebody drown when I'm talking about under $10,000 So on a yearly. And, and, and it is, there are less people doing this. Uh, and I don't know if it's a shift from the pool away from the laps, although we do have the next resolution will be about youth lap swim for competitive swimming youth. But, uh, when children get a little older, too, and the grandparents that are able to, they like to go to the ocean. They like to body surf. They like to build sand castles and stuff like that. So the pool isn't the only draw when they come down to see grandma and grandpa. So I'm definitely for this, uh, the elimination of fees, due to the lifeguards are just far too busy uh, keeping track of running herd on everybody in the pool, around the pool, making sure that you know everybody has there's civility, there's good manners, there's no running. So it's, it's quite a task at hand. Uh, so I'm for this. Okay, Ray. Uh, having been a lifeguard for five years in the past when I was a kid, so to speak, I would absolutely be opposed to lifeguards having to, to take care of tickets and money and this and that and the other. It's more imperative to watch what's going on in the pool. We lose one life and it's going to cost you a lot more than eight, nine, ten, a thousand dollars. I can guarantee you. Please have that consideration. Thank you, Maxine. I would like to add that I can talk uh, like uh, <clears throat> my colleague did here uh, from personal experience. 
uh, during college and about five, my first five years of teaching, during the summers, I was responsible for swim programs for a number of private swim clubs. And I agree, if it made 20,000, you cannot have, of course, lifeguards responsible for doing that paperwork, for collecting that money. If it really looked like it would pay to have someone sit at a table near the entrance to the pool area and just sit there to collect money, that's one thing. But unless that would pay, it probably wouldn't. You're, I think you're all really on the right track. Thank you for being so responsible about this. Thank you. Anyone else? All those in favor of the motion? Uh, it's going to be on the screen. I hope. Here we are. All right. passes. Thank you. Twelve C. Entertain a motion to approve a resolution for summer lap swim for children. And I think we had said we would call that youth. Yes. So instead of the word children, I'm going to say youth. Mine says youth. Mine says oh, Okay, but we're on C, right? Yes. 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 Okay, so youth. You're correcting it on the agenda. I'm fixing it on the agenda. Yes, okay. Um, summer lap swim for youth and uh, December initial notification, 30 day notification to comply with civil code 4360 has been satisfied to a motion. Resolution 90 19 X, summer lap swim for youth. Whereas the recreation policy states swimmers must be 16 years of age or older to use adult designated pools. And whereas on October 3rd, 2018, the board of directors introduced a resolution for summer kids swim permanent relocation to pool six between Memorial Day weekend and through the end of September annually. And whereas pool two is utilized the remainder of the year for the kids swim program from noon to 2 p.m. daily. And whereas pool six does not allow for lap swim for competitive youth swimmers during the summer months of operation. And whereas the request to use pool two for youth competitive swim practice during the summer months may be approved per current recreation department policy stating that discretion is contingent upon proper documentation provided. Now therefore be it resolved February 6, 2019 that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves summer lap swim at Pool 2 for youth ages 11 through 15 with provision of card from the Recreation Department for identification and resolve further that the officers and agents of the corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we approve the resolution. Second, Annette. Discussion. Judith. I have a question for clarification on the fifth whereas. Uh, contingent upon proper documentation, and what documentation is that? Go ahead. Okay. It's like if they're in a competitive swim program or if they're like, say, training to be um, a future Olympic, you know, in the, those kind of swim teams, they would present those types of cards that say that they do lap swims and they are definitely, you know, they definitely know how to swim. They've got that more than down. All right, this is not for kids that are going to be flapping about trying to do laps or think that they're swimmers. This is for people that do it six days a week, two, three hours a day. And, you know, it, it's to that exception because when certain, there are certain children that do do that. And when they visit their grandparents, they have to still continue on on that program, even though they're visiting. They don't get a break, per se. And, you know, th that was part of what we were doing. So the documentation covers us liability. Why? Yes, yeah. it is. Thank you. Anybody else? Since the sixth, don't you mean the fifth? Okay. All those in favor of the motion. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. Pardon? No. What? Not as we come up to February 5th. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Oh, oh. 
I see, yes. Down at the bottom where it says resolved, it would be, should be February 5th, thank you. Right, right. Okay, right. fix right. that, Joan. Okay. And now, all those in favor? Okay. And it should be on, on your screen. It's unanimous, thank you so much. We're on 12D, entertain a motion to approve a resolution for revisions to open house directional uniform signage, signage policy, December initial notification, 30 day notification to comply with civil code 4360 has been satisfied, Joan. There are a couple of Scriveners which I'm going to insert. Uh, Whitney, you'll hear. Okay, resolution 9019XX, open house directional uniform signage policy. Whereas resolution 911117, adopted on November 1st of 2011, established the open house directional uniform signage policy, and whereas the open house directional uniform signage policy is intended to improve the marketability of cooperatives and condominiums in Laguna Woods Village, and whereas the Golden Rain Foundation must update the open house directional uniform signage policy to include real estate sign requirements to conform with State of California Bureau of Real Estate, CalBRI, license disclosure requirements for advertising that went into effect on January 1st, 2018. And whereas CalBRI's new license disclosure requirements for advertising require all first point of contact solicitation materials to include, one, the name and number of the licensee, this is for both sales agents and broker associates. Two, the responsible broker's identity. This means the name under which the broker is currently licensed by Calbray and conducts business in general or is a substantial division of the real estate firm. The broker's license number is optional. And three, the status of the agent such as realtor or agent unless the name of the company makes clear that the advertisement is by a licensee. And whereas the Calbrae's requirement applies to all types of advertising, including but not limited to one for sale, open house, lease, rent, or directional signs when any licensee identification information is included. And two, any other material designed to solicit the creation of a professional relationship between the licensee and a consumer. And whereas the Marketing and Communications Division has collaborated with Village Realtors to develop updated designs for real estate signs that incorporate the new Calbray requirements. And whereas the responsibility for compliance with the law lies with Realtors, the Marketing and Communications Division working with the Realtors leveraged this opportunity to modernize the look and visibility of village real estate signage. And whereas on November 19th, 2018, the Media and Communications Committee reviewed and unanimously approved the updated real estate sign designs and recommended that the boards of directors for the Golden Rain Foundation, Third Laguna Hills Mutual, United Laguna Hills, Laguna Woods Mutual, and Mutual Number 50 adopt resolutions requiring the use of the updated real estate sign designs as soon as practicable. Now, therefore, be it resolved February 5th, 2019, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves requiring the use of the updated real estate designs beginning on May 1st, 2019, and adopts the following updated open house directional uniform signage policy. Use number one, use of the real estate signage contained in attachment one to this resolution is required effective May 1st, 2019. The use of other real estate signage eliminate is after, the, after May 1st, 2019, comma, is prohibited. 
Number Open house and directional signs. Number two, open house signs shall be 24 by 24 inches, corrugated plastic with lettering, and adhere to the GRF approved colors, font, and logo, as depicted in attachment one to this resolution. Number three, directional signs shall be from 24 inches by nine inches, corrugated plastic with the word vinyl should be in there, with vinyl lettering, and adhere to the GRF approved colors, font, and logo as depicted in attachment one of this, to this resolution. Number four, open house signs may be present on Saturday and Sunday between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. They may also be present on Wednesday and Thursday between the hours of 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. in conjunction with broker preview events. Number five, directional signs may be posted on the day of the open house no earlier than 10 a.m. and must be removed no later than 5 p.m. of the same day. Number six, at the entrance to or anywhere within a cul-de-sac, a maximum of one, parens one, open house sign per manner may be placed and number seven, open house directional, that is designated by an arrow. Signs may be placed at street intersections and cul-de-sac entrances only. No mid-block signs are allowed. And number eight, at any st street intersection or cul-de-sac entrance, there may be no more than a one directional sign pointing in any one direction, and b four total directional signs, regardless of the number of open houses in the vicinity and other. Number nine, no balloons, streamers, flags, or any other object may be attached to any signs. And number 10, realtors shall be responsible for purchasing and or providing the signs from RESS, that is Real Estate Signs and Supplies, Laguna Hills, California, and shall adhere to the specifications in accordance with this resolution. And 11, 11, okay. Turn it off. Who is that? Lucy. Number 11, nonconformance to this policy <coughs> shall result in removal of sign from premises. And number 12, non-residents must be accompanied by a licensed real estate agent approved for Laguna Woods Village entry or granted access by the seller slash resident of the property. And resolve further that members selling their properties for sale by owner shall be required to comply with the same guidelines as realtors. And resolve further that resolution 90-11117 adopted on November 1st, 2011 is hereby superseded and in its entirety and is no longer in effect. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I move we approve this resolution with the scriveners provided. <laughs> Thank you. Annette has something second. to say. Yeah, I, I second it, and I would like to speak on it, unless you'd like to speak first, if I may. No, I don't have anything to okay. Go ahead. I would like to um, speak as well. The, uh, the last whereas on the front page, Beth, the, I, I think it would just be considered scrivener. Anyway, I'm hoping it is, unless I have to do an amendment where it says the responsibility for compliance with the law lies with the realtors. I would make that a period with this insertion. The GRF security division will reinforce compliance by citing violators, period. And then the marketing and communications goes on there. I, that's my first one, I only have two. And my second one would be number 11, where it says nonconformance to this policy shall result in GRF Security Division citing violators and removing signs. Okay. Because they're the people that do it. I understand. I just don't know what to answer. Pardon? Are you making an amendment? Yeah. Should I make an amendment? Then that's what I'll do. I'll make an amendment. And does this delay this? <coughs> uh, this I don't know. delay I don't this. So. <coughs> it's just an additional. It's just an, oh, additional it's an addition. Thing. Okay. <coughs> All right. I'd like to make the am amendment then 
to amend the open house directional uniform signage policy to add in the last whereas of page one, the sentence after page one, okay. page, one on page nine of 12 on agenda item 12D. It says, whereas the responsibility for compliance with the law lies with the realtors, period. I'd like to add the sentence, the GRF security division will reinforce compliance by citing violators, period. Then begin with a capital T on the the, the marketing and community, we won't change any of that, we just inserted a sentence. And then, Whitney, are you with me on that so far? You can okay. do that in writing to her. Okay, I will. All right, and then the second one, second sentence would be number 11, Nonconformance to this policy shall result in GRF security division. I, I put down here, I'm sorry. Nonconformance to this policy shall result in GRF security division citing violators and removing signs from premises. Just go on with that. Because they're the ones that enforce the, uh, the compliance with this. And they're the ones that store. Okay, Eileen is shaking her head, I'm so sorry. maybe I, that's I, okay. I told the the they're not citing them. They're just confiscating the signs. Yeah. But yes, but but in the future they will be citing them for lack of adherence. So if we're doing the resolution, we should do it so it's global, and we just do one resolution and forget about it. Because usually what happens when the chief starts doing this is he does a rollout where he gives people a warning. Correct. And then if he does a warning for, say, it's the first quarter or two quarters, then he'll start and then we'll have, you know, all of these schedule of fees and everything else. But my, my whole thing is when we look at this, it should just be one resolution and then okay. we're done. His concern, just so everybody, you know, can hear it, is mm -hmm. when you look on the food chain of criminal activity, for lack of a better word. Um, mm -hmm. It's as important, but it's more of a, a visual type of a uh, conformity. And he's just concerned that they may be limited in their time, that they can't be going around to every sign that's wrong and writing a citation. No, we're, we're not expecting him to do that, okay. but, but we are expecting him that when people call or whatever, he's going to pull the sign out, security yeah. pulls out the sign, they bring it to his office. If that realtor wants that sign back, they got to go back to that, right. back to the chief, talk to him, and do everything else. That's correct. But I also put it in for if there are violators in the future, I understand the priority is not the highest priority for this, but I felt that since we're doing the resolution, one resolution is okay. plenty. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Eileen. Pat. Yeah, I've been waiting for a while here. Um, I'm voting no. Are you on? I'm voting no on this. I think, one, the signs are horrible, those colors. And two, I think they're way too restrictive. And if you wonder why our sales are going down, things like this uh, would add. <laughs> Point of order, we have to be speaking to the amendment first. It's on the Thank amendment. You. That's right. Well, it's we're talking part of the amendment as well. Are you speaking to the amendment, Pat? Well, I was actually speaking to the initial. Okay, then you need to wait till we get to that. To we'll have to vote to on the amendment, and then, then we'll be back to the original. Okay, anybody here on the amendment? Cash. On the amendment. No, on the amendment. The amendment, except that item number six on page ten. Maximum of one, parenthesis three. Yeah, I just corrected that. That was a Scrivener's, and I corrected it cash. And I do have a couple of things to talk about in general. Not on the no. amendment. No. On the amendment. 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 Not on the amendment. Okay. Okay. Judith. Okay, um, I'll just weigh in on the amendment. I, After hearing Eileen, I'm just wondering if... Um, I don't have any objections to putting this in, but if it tasks security, does that mean no one else is allowed to go and uh, call resident <coughs> services or, you know, police those things? Is that going to put an overburden yeah. on security to have to they police They do it now. Yeah. Siobhan, what do you think? They currently enforce this uh, now, so it shouldn't be a significant change in volume. 
Okay, all those in favor of the amendment? You have to go here. No, we can do the this amendment. This is going to be a raise of hands. Hand. Okay. Raise of hands, folks. By hand. All, those in, All favor. those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. One, two, let me see, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. All those opposed. One, two, three, four. I'm 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 a plus for the amendment. I should have counted myself. Sorry. So the mo the motion the amendment passes. Okay. If you present in writing. Yeah. Pardon. When she does it, do it. In yes. Writing. Present that in writing, please, to Whitney. So can it be clear. Thank you. Um, now where we are is discussion on the motion to accept the. Okay, so the first person to speak will be Pat. Well, I'll just pretty much repeat myself. I think, one, these colors are horrible. The green that we have now on most of the signs is quite effective. And why we go to this awful color, I don't know. But that's everybody's opinion, except mine, I guess. And then, as far as all these restrictions are concerned, if we think we're having a hard time with real estate right now, our sales are plummeting. Not so much in third, but certainly in United, we've got sales way down. And the more of these kind of things that we add, the harder it is going to be for us to sell. I've had a unit on the market for eight or nine months, finally sold it. But uh, United are experiencing a lot of problems with their sales. So I'm definitely against this motion to add more restrictions on what they can and can't do. Thank you. OK. Um I'm, I'm going to go right now to Eileen to discuss the colors and then come back. I know it's out of order, but it's fresh in the mind here. What I'm about to say is the same thing that I said last time that we brought this up. Yeah. First of all, we put together a committee of realtors here in the community, and we met with them, and we showed them a number of different signs and in other mm -hmm. color palettes. They chose this color palette, and I want to make that very clear. They felt very strongly that they wanted their signs to be visible, that the green blended in way too much with our hedges. And they felt that if we were going to go with a brighter color like this, the continuity and the conformity would make it work. You'd know that it's on the market, or that's for lease, that's for sale. The other thing is, we are not changing anything other than the sign. Every single thing that you're reading there is a policy that's been in place here in the village, in some cases, since the early 90s. It's the same exact policy. We're just making sure that the realtors are following the new California law, that they have their broker number on the sign. And we're trying to get back to the way, it, at one point it was, which is a conformative sign for realtors. So I just, I think there's a lot of confusion that we're oh, we're making this rule and we're making that rule. The rules are all the same. It's just a sign. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that. Thank you for clarifying that. Siobhan, did you want to say something? She covered it. OK, um, and then went up here on the board. Bert. I objected uh, to this the last time. Uh, item 10 on the uh, listing here that uh, basically specifies the supplier of the sign, we specify explicitly the specifications of the sign. And for that reason, I see no reason why we should demand that the realtor has to go to a sole source who could set any price they'd like um, when they might be able to go to another source that could produce that sign at a lower cost. I think it just rubs me the wrong way. So I'm going to vote against this. You want to speak to you want? Yes. Well, first of all, it's the same sign company that, Everybody from what I understand in talking to realtors, I'm not one, they all go to this particular sign shop. And I found out firsthand last week that this is all they do, because I was looking for some other signs for something. They only do real estate signs. They specialize in knowing what the law is. That's fine. And I know I, you heard me talk to counsel, Bert, about this after the last meeting. 
and he compared it to how we send people to Vista Paint. Vista Paint has the correct color for the outside of our buildings or you're gonna paint your front door. It's no different. We want conformity. We wanna make sure they're all in the same quality material. And again, this is, and I've talked to quite a few friends that are realtors, this is where they all go. This is, this is the source. And it's been my understanding from Pam Bashline that we've been using them for over 20 years. Got okay, Barrett. Yeah. I'm Second. willing to specify a recommended supplier, okay, but not a mandatory supplier. So I'm saying, you know, that uh, such a sign might be acquired by something that is not specifically in demand that says you have to. Okay, thank you. I think Judith was next and then Annette. Um, just for clarity, the first resolve further does state that for sale by owners, uh, have to comply with the same guidelines, so but we won't have a license to put on the sign. But we can go to the same vendor and have the same sign made up that will say for sale by owner. Yes. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And it, okay. And this is the equivalent of like when you work in a federal agency and you have only one place to go to get stuff done if you're working with us. But basically, you want to protect your logo. You don't want to see your logo hijacked and be put on some real estate person's <clears throat> sign like he has. Uh, some people walk into his office and then they think, oh, he's blessed by Laguna Woods Village and that's why I'm going to go here. And he could be rather unscrupulous. So what we're trying to do is keep our brand, you know, we've invested thousands upon thousands of dollars in this. We, you know, we're, we know what we're doing. The realtors know what they're doing. They've been doing this for over two decades. And we want to make sure we preserve it. We trust the guy. That's just, it's part of doing business. Thank you. Ray. Ray. Bert, first you, Bert had his hand up, didn't you? Oh, oh. okay. Um, I'd like to stay with this particular thing. If you go to another company, they're not used to having that a, a logo specifically for 24 by 24, or whatever the case may be. So they may have to spend more money to get this particular thing done at, to that particular size. So I say this, we've got it set up. The realtor people are happy with what's going on. Let's leave it alone. It's a standard. Okay. Cash. Uh, our community depends on real estate for our resales. Now, we are trying to impose, for realtors, they work hard, and it's very difficult to get in. Sorry about that. Um, realtors really do work hard. I know it. And they're underpaid because selling is not that easy. Now, on top of that, if we are going to impose changing new signs to be brought from, bought from some certain vendor, it's going to mean more expense to them. Already our sales are hurting, and we are making it even more complicated by imposing restrictions. Uh, present signs are green, so be it. All they need is to put their license number or BRE number on it, which they can stick on that sign with a plastic overlay or something, because the state wants that. But instead, if you make them buy these signs, these are not cheap, and every realtor has to buy like half a dozen of these signs to direct them to the particular unit they are going to hold an open house to. Also, the, these big ones here, they lose the identity. If everybody, every realtor is going to put the same kind of open house sign, you don't know which home, which realtor is holding. There's no picture, no photo, uh, nothing. They all will look identical. First of all, that color is horrible. And you have to not impose more fund, more expenses to these poor realtors. They're already hurting, and our sales are hurting. Our sales will hurt even more if we keep pursuing this kind of things against realtors. Thank you. I thought I saw Siobhan looking like she wanted to speak. No, yes. OK. I think it's time for us to vote. Okay, nine yes, two 
two no. Motion passes. Thank you. 12E, entertain a motion to approve a resolution for digital cable services fee structure and tier system. December, initial notification, 30-day notification to comply with Civil Code 4360 has been satisfied. Joan. Resolution 90-19-XX, digital cable services fee structure and tier system. Whereas the Golden Rain Foundation currently offers a digital pay tier system that includes four rental choices or four set-top boxes, and whereas the Media and Communications Committee has recommended adjustments in the fee schedule to address higher costs for digital access and programming fees associated with cable cards, SD digital converters, and HD digital converters. Now therefore, be it resolved on February 5th, 2019, the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts the proposed digital pay tier system fee schedule as attached to the official minutes of this meeting. And resolved further, resolution 90-18-17 adopted February 6, 2018 is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of this corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we approve this resolution. Do I have a second? I second. Annette is seconding. Did you want to speak on it? No. Joan? If you look at the proposed fee schedule, you'll see that the uh, increases are very slight. On page uh, three of six, especially, uh, before the cable card access fees of we're recommending 495 before they were free and people were able to get all the channels they wanted but they didn't pay anything now it's time to to charge for these to charge for these uh, cards on the, the three cards you see in front of you in blue they're going to charge now 495 for each of those no, the third one is seven ninety-five. Seven, eight, pardon, seven ninety-five for the uh, high de high def digital converter programming. Okay. Okay. Judith. So to clarify the pricing, um, like I have one of these HD boxes, am I going to have a total of almost eighteen dollar increase? No, or it's not the boxes. These are cards they're talking about. The <laughs> cards are inserted. You have the cable card card access fee. Mm -hmm. There's a, also a, a standard definition uh, card. There's also a high definition card. So I would only have one of those cards. But you don't have the card. You have the box. Okay. Okay. There's a difference. We're talking thanks. about cards, oh. not boxes. Okay. Thanks. So the boxes haven't had an increase in the no, cards. The boxes, have. The boxes have the same. Okay. Anybody else on the board? Anybody out there? Oh, Jim, did you want to say something? No. Okay. All those in favor of the motion, please vote on screen. Thank you. Motion passes. Now we're on 13 new business entertain a motion to introduce a resolution for proposed amendments to GRF Recreation and Special Events Department policies and procedures and glossary and mandatory adherence. Resolution 90-19-XX, proposed amendments to GRF Recreation and Special Events Department policies and procedures and glossary and mandatory adherence, whereas the Golden Rain Foundation has established a recreation and special events department policies and procedures to streamline and reduce confusion regarding use of its facilities by residents. Whereas on September 13, 2018, the CAC formed an ad hoc committee comprised of committee members and residents 
to review and recommend revisions to the GRF Recreation and Special Events Department policies and procedures. And whereas the emphasis of the review was on commercial activities conducted by Laguna Woods Village clubs, groups, and organizations, and whereas the Community Activities Committee recommends the amendments to the Recreation and Special Events Department policies and procedures with the insertion of the glossary and mandatory adherence, attachment one and attachment two. And now therefore, be it resolved February 5th, 2019, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby introduces the proposed amendments to GRF Recreation and Special Events Department policies and procedures and glossary and mandatory adherence. Resolved further that resolution 90-16-15 Adopted December 16th, 2016. Resolution 90-15-52, adopted October 6th, 2015. Resolution 90-15-53, adopted October 6th of 2015. Resolution 90-16-32, adopted August 2nd of 2016. And Resolution 90-16-42, adopted September 6th of 2016, are hereby superseded and canceled to the extent that they differ. And resolution, I'm sorry, and resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move that we accept this resolution at this point for discussion purposes and postpone the final vote for 28 days to comply with Civil Code 4360. Do I have a second? Diane. Do a second? Diane. Yeah, Diane seconded it. Okay, can I? Okay. I want to call your attention. Okay, can I speak Yes, first? go ahead, John. I want to call your attention to attachment one, uh, which is page five of 24. These are the changes that were made. The revision is in the right large column. The revisions are in the right large column. And that's on, on pages six, uh, five and six. And those are the things that were changed in the policies. So I'm assuming you read them. <laughs> Okay. Yes, go ahead. The only thing that I saw was uh, number 20, which is the uh, agenda item 13A, page 12 of 24. On the bottom on number 20, where it says tours, filming, and or photography in any recreational facility for commercial purposes must be approved in advance through the marketing and communications division. And I'm wondering why we also didn't do in tandem put down the GRF security division since they have the pilots for drones and stuff like that. I had no idea. I just didn't know what, you know, for discussion. I, I believe that this is still in the works and not has not been changed yet. We are still looking at the policy for uh, filming filming in the village. Oh, okay, so that's a separate that's, thing. That's a separate yeah. thing. Okay. And thank you, we'll remember to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. All right, and then the, um, and maybe it would be the same thing for the emeritus, uh, would be uh, page 14 of 24, number D. Non-resident students must use a saddleback pass to attend classes. And I was just wondering if it shouldn't be saddleback picture ID and parking pass to attend classes for emeritus. But just leave that with them, too? Again, that's not what we're talking about today. Okay. And thank you. We'll please remind me. We'll continue. Oh, I've got it marked up. Thank you so much for yeah. correcting me. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, I'm one of those, um, for the residents at home, too, that may not understand exactly uh, the detail of this. A lot of residents have been waiting for um, this rule to come about so their clubs can have at least two fundraisers a year through like a flea market type with restrictions. And this is that change that's going to allow us to do that, uh, not for making money purposes necessarily, but so that residents have an opportunity to uh, show and share their homemade goods that they made at Clubhouse for, and or uh, really high-priced items that they their family doesn't want, things that they have no one to leave to, like 
China silver crystal family heirlooms that nobody wants, and, but it's too good to throw in a dumpster or give to Goodwill. So it gives them an opportunity to um, share that with the rest of the community. And so I'll be obviously in favor of this and hope everyone will. Thank you. Yes. There's one other thing that may not be obvious, but now residents are no longer able, single residents are no longer able to have fundraising events on their own. It's got to be a club, an organization, or uh, a group. It is not single people. People are uh, still allowed, obviously, to have memorials and any kind of social gatherings, but it's no, no longer commercial. If you really have to do that sort of thing, you have it in your own home, or you can probably do it in a rec room downstairs in the third buildings. I'm not recommending this, but it's, it's the GRF facilities that are forbidding commercial activities on the part of residents. We have one speaker. Hi, Dick. Hi, Dick Rainer, 278. <clears throat> Just a point of clarification on page 6 of 24, which lists the changes that were made. Uh, if you look at the second one under fundraisers, oh, it does say fundraisers. But anyway, it says club, club organizations may sell products, hold silent auctions, special shows, and great events. By the recreation right. department. That's for fundraisers only. It has to be made exceptionally clear. I didn't see up above that it was under B. I only read the thing in isolation. And I thought that I just want to make it clear that it's fundraisers only. Okay. <coughs> Anybody else? Diane. I guess we can't say enough that we do want flyers and signs to say, for Laguna Woods residents and their guests only. Those yes. rules still apply. Yes. yes, that rule still applies. I'd just like to put in a plug for this committee and say September through December, they're still working on revisions. This, this was one huge task, and keeping in mind as they were doing it, the needs in our community. This governs the facilities, how we use it, and we're trying to do the best. I know they're working to do the best for all of, all of the community. Thank you. Shall we vote? All those in favor of this motion, please vote on screen. It's unanimous. Motion passes, thank you. Okay. We are now on item 14, committee reports. <coughs> A, financial committee reports, Diane Phelps. Right. Director Phelps. Okay, um, I'll cue cl the slides, please. Uh, we have a lot to talk about this month because this will be the first time that we're now looking at um, all of last year. Uh, we're going to look at the financial statements that cover the period January 1st through December 31st of 2018. Um, they're not yet audited, so we refer to them as preliminary <coughs> financial statements. Slide one shows that through the reporting period, total revenue for GRF from all sources was $43.3 million dollars and total expenses were $42.5 million, resulting in net revenue just over $800,000. However, what isn't on that uh, is that, it's good, on that slide is that when we compare this amount to budgeted, to the budgeted amount of $2.4 million, we see the GRF for the year was actually worse than budget by $1.6 million. We'll see later in slide three which accounts contributed to the shortfall and which had a surplus, but for now, let's go ahead and look at our operating budget, see how it performed. Now slide two. This slide shows activity and operations. After backing out reserve and contingency funds revenue and expenses, as well as depreciation, which is not funded through operations, we can see bottom line operations ended the year with $788,000 more in expenses than revenue. So you may be asking, what do we do to make up the $788,000? There are a few things we can do. 
The first is to look to our contingency fund. We already moved $350,000 from our contingency fund to our operating fund, which brings the $788,000 figure down to $438,000. Uh, we can cut back on spending in 2019 and apply any surplus to the 2018 for shortfall. And we can also cover whatever is left of the 2018 shortfall in the 2020 budget. While $438,000 sounds like a lot of money, to put it in perspective, it is about 1.5% of our current year operating expenses. Now let's move on to slide three. As I mentioned above, this slide shows where we had the most significant variance between actual results and the amount budgeted. We tracked and discussed these variances each month as they developed throughout 2018, so we have known for quite a few months that we had less revenue than we expected and more expenses than we had budgeted for. Where we saw a trend early enough, adjustments were made to the 2019 budget and capital plan. So for for 2018, GRF was worse than budget in the following areas. Outside services were more than budget by $553,000 due to a reclassification of some broadband expenses, more outside repairs of generators and vehicles, and also unbudgeted village marketing and communication programs. Legal fees were higher than budget by almost $500,000 due to higher legal fees and arbitration services for labor issues. Clubhouse rentals and event fees were, uh, were higher in 2018 than they were in 2017, but they were $364,000 lower than we had budgeted. Uh, and this, we think, is primarily due to lower revenue generating events at the Performing Arts Center. Cable programming and copyright and franchise fees were $234,000 over budget. This was due to contracts renewed during the year that resulted in higher than budgeted programming fees, such as the CBS and NBC network packages. In addition, we paid more than budgeted in <coughs> franchise fees because we had additional broadband revenue. And then there were the trust facilities fee. They were $534,000 under budget. They were down in the first quarter of 2018 as we transitioned from a fee of $2,500 to $5,000. In addition, 2018 sales were 21% lower than last year, as is the case for much of Southern California. I mentioned the trust facilities fees last because unlike the others, this variance impacted our reserves, not our operating budget. Our reserve funds are large and we accumulate and spend them over many years, so the impact is less immediate than for the operating fund. In addition, this shortfall is mitigated by the savings we put back into our reserves last year as projects closed under budget. Uh, we expected a favorable variance, we experienced a favorable variance in some categories, so it wasn't all dismal. Broadband services revenue was $521,000 higher than budgeted due to more internet subscribers and set top box rent rentals, although as noted, this did mean that we did pay more franchise fees. Uh, investment interest income was up $317,000. And again, this is an issue, this just favorably impacts reserves. This doesn't have any impact on our operating budget. And then there's income tax expense, which was down by $152,000. Now if we can move on to slide four. On this pie chart, we show non-assessment revenues received last year of $13 million by category. Broadband services generated the most revenue, followed by the trust facilities fees, golf operations, and so forth. Non-assessment revenue helps keep down our assessments. Slide five. Expenses to date of $37.6 million, excluding depreciation, are shown by category on this pie chart. Our largest category is compensation, followed by cable TV, utilities, insurance, professional and legal, and materials <coughs> and supplies. And then on to slide six. The reserve and contingency fund adjusted balances are shown on slide six. <clears throat> Starting with the first column on the left, the funds show a combined balance of $28.2 million at year end. Included in this total are contributions received last year through assessments, trust facilities, fees, and interest earnings. The second column shows work in progress of $5.1 million, which reflects the amounts paid for projects that are not yet complete. 
The third column shows the net of the first two. The net adjusted fund balances are $23.1 million. And then the last slide. Slide seven is a summary of our detailed reserve expenditures report. Column one shows approved expenditures of $22.5 million as of December 31st, 2018. Included in this figure are all 2018 capital plan items and supplemental appropriations, early release of some 2019 capital plan items, as well as amounts approved in prior years that were carried over for completion. The second common re column reflects expenditures and, and is entitled incurred to date or what has been paid since the funding was approved. We can see that $11.8 million has been booked as of December 31st, 2018. And then the final column shows $9.7 million, the remaining encumbrances. This is the amount approved by the board for open projects that has not yet been spent. That's it for the slides, but I remind you that more detail is now included in the GRF board meeting agenda packet. Page eight of eight for agenda item 14A is a copy of the variance report that gives you more information than I can say on air in a couple of minutes. In addition, much more detail is provided in the GRF finance committee meeting agenda packets, which are available online and at GRF finance committee meetings. We didn't have a finance committee meeting in January, but the select audit task force met and the audit schedule was set. We have our first meeting with KPMG on February 22nd and the annual audit reports will be presented to the GRF United and third boards on April the 1st. Mutual 50 is audited, but it's just not a part of this audit. Um, our investment ad hoc committee also met. The RFI has been issued and responses are due February 21st. Our next GRF Finance Committee meeting is Wednesday, February the 20th at 1.30 in the boardroom. Merrill Lynch and BlackRock will be giving their semi-annual presentation of GRF's investment portfolio as well as United and Thirds. Again, Mutual 50, um, their investment po portfolio is handled by someone, but it's handled, it, it's just not reported in this, um, in this meeting. That's it for the Finance Committee report. Thank you for listening. Diane, thank you so much for being so complete and tutoring us through this. Okay. Thank you so much. Next, we have Annette with the Community Activities Committee. Good morning, everyone. On Thursday, January the 10th of 2019 at 1.30 p.m., we met here in the boardroom and we recommended what was passed today just a few moments earlier, the proposed amendments to the GRF Recreation and Special Events Department policies and procedures and the glossary and mandatory, mandatory adherence. Um, so that was, uh, got moved up to uh, this board meeting. The other thing that happened was we talked about facility enhancements, include Clubhouse One testing of structural integrity and potential presence of asbestos in order to proceed with enhancements. Clubhouse Four had OSHA compliance issues that have been corrected with the paint booth ventilation as the last to be addressed. Pool Five is being replastered with estimated completion by the end of January to early February. All pools will receive new furniture in 2019. The garden centers will have a common area introduced as plans are being finalized. All chairs at the clubhouses will be replaced and the library receive new lounge chairs. Operational improvements include a survey conducted in conjunction with Saddleback Emeritus to better improve class needs and it was mailed to all residents. 500 completed surveys have been received thus far. What's on uh, for February is the Valentine's Day dinner dance. It'll be hosted at Clubhouse One with Close Harmony entertaining us for $35. This includes dinner, entertainment, beer, and wine. A paint class with Penny Rubin. Oh, actually, that already, uh, I'm sorry. That already happened on January the 18th, but there'll be another paint and pour that'll be hosted on February 7th at Clubhouse One. This event sells out. Oh, God, it sells out almost same day. Then there will be, uh, there'll be Timeless Melodies will be in Clubhouse 2 and it will feature the music of Richard Rogers. This will be a two-part series, February 5th, which will be tonight, and Early Broadway and March 5th, which will feature Rogers and Hammond style. 
Hammerstein compilations. Actually, I think it's 1.30 in the afternoon. Mr. McRae reported that golf is a bit quieter as the days are shorter. The range shack at the driving range is nearly complete and will assist with better customer service. Mr. McRae is meeting next week to discover the scope of the driving range landscaping improvements. <coughs> Pickleball and paddle are coming along and the uh, courts are scheduled to open the first part of February. The, the golf maintenance office building will be updated in 2019. And uh, I did request uh, staff to look into, uh, for Brian Gruner, a hearing loop for the boardroom. Other than that, the date of our next meeting is uh, GRF Community Activities Committee will be held at 1.30 p.m. at the Community Center here in the boardroom on Thursday, March 14th, 2019. Thank you. Discussion. Okay, thank you, Annette. We are now on item C, the report of the maintenance and construction committee. Director Matson. Okay. We did have did not have a meeting um, last month, and uh, but I so I'd like to give you an idea of some of the activities, what status some of our hot activities. <clears throat> uh, first one is pickle paddle. Tennis court project. MNC department has completed the installation of all necessary electrical circuits and construction of the reinforced concrete post tension slab. The <clears throat> shade structure and court lighting has also been completed. Windscreens, court, court, court coatings, nets, final electrical power and walkways around the court facility are scheduled to be constructed through the month of February. Coating and striping of the courts has been completed. As the project gets closer to completion, staff will announce a reopening date. Number two, gate security project. The security of our community is paramount to GRF. Securing our gates through the installation of automatic gate arms and security systems has been a long-term goal of the board and the MNC uh, department. Is pleased to announce the groundbreaking date for the gate security projects. Construction on gates two and eight commence on February the 4th. Each gate will be closed to vehicles throughout the construction process, but will be open for pedestrian access. The alternate Gates for vehicles access include gates 10 and 7. If you are familiar with the proximity of your residence in relation to these gates, maps will be available at the gate houses as well as resident services located on the first floor at the community center. Construction working hours will be from 7 to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 a.m to 3 p.m. on Saturdays. Work on these gates is anticipated to last five to six weeks. Once work is completed on gates two and eight, construction will be initiated at the next pair. And if you need any help, uh, call me or call Ernesto um, at uh, maintenance, who's our maintenance and construction director at 268. 2281. 268 2281. Thank you, Jim. And our next meeting um, is the second Wednesday of this month, which just happens to be next Wednesday the 13th. Okay. Thanks for getting us up to date on, on the, the gate closures. The next piece on that is a report of the uh, PAC, the uh, Performing Arts Center Renovation Ad Hoc Committee. And I chair that, and we have not had a meeting. We're waiting for the architects to come in with some more design plans. And then after that, the Energy Task Force. And Bert, did you want to say something? How about um, maybe Dick? Would he like to say something? You, did, you don't have. I was a little absent. Uh... Yeah, I know you were. You, <laughs> you're a little bit out of commission. We're working on having a heart attack. I know. 
Dick, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Okay. All right, then we are going to go to the report of Media and Communications Committee, Director Millman. The Media and Communications Committee met on Monday, January 21st at 1.30 p.m. here in the village. And it was kind of our Happy New Year meeting. Uh, the many accomplishments of both IT and MARCOM were revealed, and our meeting was quite full of presentations, but let me get down to the nitty gritty. Um, Mr. Holland reported on broadband and the contracts that we are uh, facing right now, with CBS, NBC, and Fox being very high in their costs. Uh, they're approaching those three with, uh, as, a, as a community, it's not just us, but many other communities together with our uh, are the guy who, who does this for us. Uh, however, our costs are, are offset through internet subscription and ad <coughs> insertion. The subscriber counts are constantly ra being raised here and this is all to the good. Another point that was made by Mr. Holland is the idea of a mapping and channel three guide. The th channel three guide is coming up often because people miss the old guide that's the, the rotating, you know, the running guide on channel three. Well, since channel three has been eliminated, we are not, it's just not going to be there anymore. It's important that people begin to invest in digital converters of some kind. Um, and we're working also on, on the rates for those things. But if you have a digital converter, digital, digital televisions would map the channels to the correct number. Digital televisions would no longer need to be rescanned when changes are made. Digital television would have an interactive guide to replace channel three. Digital televisions would provide whole number channels instead of the dot, you know, the sub channels that you see. And digital te televisions would receive encrypted programming content, which is required by the networks. Um, the goal of the community is to continue providing competitive basic cable services at competitive prices that are included in monthly assessments. Uh, to increase the resident satisfaction and to reduce customer service phone calls. Eventually this is going to be smoothed out, but right now it's difficult for many to understand that you still need something to convert from analog to digital. You can keep your old analog TV, but you have to have a converter of some kind. And the cheapest one is four ninety four twenty five a month. So we're working on this, and I just want you to know it's not gone blank. Miss um, Pollan uh, reported on marketing and communications. Um, one of the things she is, is reviewing right now is a policy regarding photography and filming in the village. And there have been lots of requ several requests from outside vendors to photograph and film in the village. And this includes the use of drones. We have a drone policy, but there's now going to be a subcommittee working on this in conjunction with, with herself and Brian Gruner. And we will have something for you at our next meeting as far as policy on photography and filming. Some of the future, one of the future agenda items will be that uh, we're going to, we're probably going to come up with a press policy, which we haven't discussed much yet. It's something new. What do you do when the village is on, in the press? What do you say? And we need to have an idea of well, how, you know, when CBS comes to your door, well, what do you think of? Have you heard of? And uh, this happens in other communities, and it could happen in ours, we need to have some kind of a policy for how residents have, need to answer, how board members need to answer. Not that we're dictating what you answer, but feeling comfortable with when the media comes to you that this is the way you proceed. And that'll be discussed next time. So our next meeting will be Tuesday, February 26th at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom. 
Okay, thank you, Joan. And next, we're going to have a report of the Mobility and Vehicles Committee. Director Gross, please. Uh, yes, this may be a little lengthy, but I believe it's important for me to put out specific information. We have a new manager, Chris Loganauer. This gentleman, I'm telling you, is phenomenal. He hadn't even been on the job where I spoke with him and one of the other people spoke with him, where a couple of individuals had some real challenges that were going on. He met with them and is already working on that. Since he's taken over, and by the way, we're not supposed to be talking to staff too frequently. However, I've gotten the okay from <clears throat> our president because of the new management system that's coming about. Uh, I needed to be able to speak to this gentleman, and he has done a phenomenal job. For instance, last month we talked, in, and I'll make this as brief as I can. Last month we talked about evaluation of fixed routes and plan a ride, approval for supplementing funding to replace plan a ride, approval of vehicles to be purchased with the 2019 early release funds, continued upgrade and improvement of the ride now scheduling software, and grant requirements compliance. I meet with him a couple of times a month or even more now, and here it gives you an idea of what he has come up with already. Reviewed all proposals and made selections of recommended consulting firm to review our transportation systems routes, which will be discussed on the m &V meeting on February 6th. That's tomorrow afternoon. We meet with the bus company to begin the repairs of the new 2018 plan ride-along bus that was very noisy. That's already been addressed. They're working on it, repairing it, and we do not have to put out a dime. He had the managing person come in and ride with him. Institute a pilot fixed route stop at Aldi's based on input from the residents. That information was put in in the newspaper last week and, and people have asked him to do this and this is his compliance already. Met and road fixed routes, buses with residents to get input on overall transportation system. He's ridden with at least six different people. Finalized specifications and audit replacement van that was recently damaged beyond repair. He's coordinating with VMS staff department to purchase new and replacement vehicles for 2019. Tomorrow, what we'll be doing is this is the, the information. He will be presenting the Mobility and Vehicle Committee information regarding a supplementing funding to award a contract for bus services. This gives you the full outline of what the program is going to be involving with, what these people are, their education. So this is absolutely phenomenal. I believe <clears throat> that the folks that are involved on the committee in this committee and the people that will be attending this uh, committee in the future will be very pleased with this gentleman as he's already done a tremendous job. Thank you. Oh, the next meeting, like I said, is tomorrow afternoon at 1.30. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, Ray, we don't have down there the Laguna Canyon Foundation. Did you want to say something at this point? Before sure, I'll on? be glad to. Um, we, at the front desk, I make sure that we have the Laguna Coast Park and the other information from the Laguna Canyon Foundation at the front desk. <coughs> Excuse me, if you have any challenges, you need to find out information, you can call 949-497-8324. That's 949-497-8324. <coughs> they will be able to tell you what's going on and give you good information as to maybe costs that may be involved in a situation. Thank you. I'll ask him. Um, and did you need to leave for any purposes, or can you stay here? And no, it, it's it's okay. Uh, she's taking care of everything. Okay. I was going to do that, but perfect. Okay. So we can put you at your regular spot for traffic. Alrighty. Thank you so much. So we are now on um, item F, security. Director Tibbetts. Yeah, we didn't have a meeting last month. But I'd like to bring you up to date on a few items. As Jim mentioned, the installation of the uh, <clears throat> security gates uh, started the 4th of uh, this month. And it's going to be a tremendous asset to the security of this village. We have the gates now, as you know, uh, in gates 5 and 6, the security arms in 5 and 6, and it has almost completely eliminated gate crashers. Uh, we still have gate cra uh, crashers. They will ride in on the outside lane. They'll wave a piece of paper, a card, and keep mm -hmm. going. And the time uh, security is called, they're gone. You can't find them. This will completely eliminate all of that. Um, 
We uh, are also going to provide better security in the maintenance yard. That yard has been open to the public since oh, forever, I guess. We're going to put a gate against, uh, across that main road, and uh, that will eliminate outsiders just going up there and looking around. And I think that starts this month. Actually, we're going to implement Monday, March 4th. March 4th, thank you. And another major project that will start, well, preliminary, preliminary planning has started, but a big move will be uh, maintenance. Uh, uh, the maintenance building now houses security, and security will be moving over to this building. That building uh, is sinking slowly. It was sinking eight years ago when I moved here. It's and the uh, And because of the uh, sinking, it is cracking. It should be replaced. And then we've talked about that for years. Maybe we'll get around to it. But it is too crowded and it's inefficient for uh, security, and they will be over here. And at this time, I'll ask uh, Ray Gross report on the traffic hearings. Uh, okay. Uh, the committee met on Wednesday, January the 16th. <coughs> Excuse me. The committee's purpose is to make sure that our community is protected from excessive speeding and other traffic violations, such as improper parking, unauthorized commercial vehicle parking, and or operations, et cetera, which can jeopardize the safety of our residents. Violators are ticketed by our security personnel, and on most occasions, a fine is levied in encouragement visits to encourage violators to follow our village safety rules. The responsibility Responsible parties for ticketing vehicles are offered to offered a, a choice of paying the fine after notification by security or attending the monthly committee hearing. The committee is compiled comprised of four directors, one each from United, Third, Fifty, and GRF. Cited people are scheduled from 9 a.m. to 12 noon and from 1 to 3 p.m. as necessary. At the hearing, each case is discussed and fines levied as appropriate. The committee provides leniency whenever possible and is determined by majority vote after further discussion by the committee after the public part of the hearing. First time offenders are offered a, charge, a chance to partake in a two hour traffic school. Hearing results are in village only and the results are not given to DMV nor to insurance companies. At the last meeting, 29 people were scheduled for the hearing of whom five represented seven notices of violation didn't show up resulting in automatic determination of the fines proposed by security. Of the 24 who appeared, 14 were found to be responsible for the offense and to deserve the fine. Four had the offenses and the fine waived. Five were found responsible for the offense but received no fine and one was referred back to staff for further review. A lot of times people get concerned because they get a letter through the mail saying, I wasn't uh, stopped, nobody stopped me, and why are you writing me a ticket for no uh, driver's license? The policy is we cannot, we cannot stop you outside, but once you commit a, a notice of violation in here and you do not stop, they follow you outside the gate, usually take a picture of your driver's uh, vehicle license and a picture of the person driving. That's where the, the letter comes from. Then when they come in, I always ask to see the driver's license for insurance purposes only. Then that is waived that they have a license. Of course, you can't stop them if, you, if they're not here. We cannot stop people on the outside, but that takes care of a lot of the complaints that we get. Why did I get a ticket? Well, what happens, unfortunately, is people seem to have other things on their mind sometimes and don't adhere to what's going on. And we try to let them know at the meetings you know, you say you stopped, you will show you a picture of them speeding through the stop sign 20 miles an hour. We also have pictures of people parking on sidewalks, and we explain to them it's sometimes very difficult for people in wheelchairs to get by so they have to go out in the street and they may be hit. So these things are done by the committee, and we're really getting, believe it or not, thank yous from a lot of people. Anyway, the next meeting will be uh, February uh, 20th at uh, 9 a.m. in this boardroom. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Next will be Judy Trotman, who will, will report on disaster preparedness. Okay. Thank you. Um, that was an excellent report, Ray, I have to say. And I'm going to be speaking to the televised audience as well. 
At this time of day, by the time we do these committee reports, we're down to about six, seven people in the audience. So I want to commend and thank those on TV that are still here with us. Um, a lot of, when resolutions are passed through these committees, and you could hear the reports, they give so much information and what's gone on during the month, uh, yet residents often complain that that's the first time they heard about a particular issue by the time it comes up in form of a resolution. Well, it's because they leave or turn the TV off before we get to these reports. And so keep that in mind. These committee reports are very important. And if you've missed anything, this um, board meetings are replayed two to three times. Uh, I think sometimes uh, on Thursday the same the, in the evening sometime. But so, um, so I want to thank, again, the TV audience for sticking around. And there's been two changes to task to the uh, task force members, and I'll get those to you, Whitney, so you can put them on the GRF committee appointment sheet. Um, our last meeting was January 29th at 9.30 here in the boardroom. We have moved to the boardroom due to the changes made up to the second floor. So we meet on the last Tuesday of odd months, 9.30, AM here in this boardroom until further notice. The training coming up, there will be good neighbors captains training. And any resident uh, in times of a community disaster, a good captain will knock on the neighbor's door and make notes of any resident or situation that would require a first responder. The good neighbor captain then relays that information to the emergency operator center through a coordinator. This is the fastest and most efficient way to get first responders where they're needed the most after a natural disaster, especially when normal forms of communication may be compromised. The next Good Neighbor Captain's training class will be tomorrow, Clubhouse 7, Wednesday, February 6th, from 2 to 4. If you haven't already signed up for this class, please feel free to drop in for free coffee, snacks, and information. There is absolutely no obligation. Uh, our first class on diabetes and stroke will be Monday, March 4th, from 1 to 4 p.m., also at Clubhouse 7. And if you fail to make reservations, just drop in. Uh, the, basic, the next basic first aid training will be April 15th, 2019, from 1 to 4 p.m., also at Clubhouse 7. We have classes scheduled all the way to next October. You can obtain a copy of the schedule from the Disaster Preparedness Office, which is here on the first floor in the northeast corner of this building. They are open daily from 10 to 12. You can call the office manager at 949-395-6419 or stop by his office for a copy. Or you can go to the Laguna Woods website under security, follow disaster preparedness, and then down to training, and you can find the schedule there. Security has implemented a new code red system that uses text messaging to alert clubhouse coordinators and task force members of an imminent or potential emergency. As an important reminder, also if your contact information is not up to date, please contact Debbie Bellesteros at 949-268-2356. And that's if you're a clubhouse coordinator or a good neighbor captain, uh, they need to know current information on the task force managers so that they could get this text message to the proper number. Uh, also a reminder, uh, residents with pets are responsible to have their own pet carrier. The task force has a tentative plan for pets during an emergency uh, situation, such as a major earthquake, but assistance with your pet absolutely requires you to have a tagged and ID'd pet carrier. We are working on a, a formal plan of what we're going to do with the pets, but right now it's a tentative plan. The next meeting will be March 26th at 9.30, again here in the boardroom. And if you watch the Weather Channel every so often, they will um, show, uh, I hate to say, use the word examples, but do a segment on how disasters have affected certain individuals, their lives, their family, 
uh, displacement. And uh, I think we need to be very, very aware of being prepared for a natural disaster. And those people suffering right now, um, they've had loss of homes, property, health, and life of loved ones during these recent, especially uh, what's going on in the East Coast and across the country. If we could please just have 15 seconds of silence of all those who are suffering from natural disaster here in the country. Thank you. So again, also every resident should check periodically with resident services to make sure they also have your emergency contact information uh, correct. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> Very thorough. That uh, concludes the security report. Our next meeting will be February 25th at 1.30 in this room. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And next we have the report of the Landscape Committee, and it will be Director Matson. He was gracious and substituted for Director Maldo, who was out having just a wonderful time <laughs> in the hospital and recovering and whatnot. So, so thank you, Jim. Okay, I went into this very innocent. And looking at the agenda, there are only two items on the agenda, and I said, this is a piece of cake. We'll be out of here in 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the two items, one was the Aliso Creek update. And, and um, I've been in meetings with that before, and that's a very, very complex issue. It's a very innocent-looking little body of water that moves through uh, the United area, but that uh, there are so many um, groups, uh, state, federal kinds of people involved in in the in that because they need to be um, we we need to be careful what goes in that we we need to know how uh, what's the maximum minimum water flows through there um, <clears throat> anyway. Um, there are a lot of um, people, uh, a number of board members at the, new on the board that were not familiar with this, and they had lots of questions and challenging certain things, and so it went around for round and round for quite a while. Once we got through that little thing, um, we uh, there was an item here that says elimination of Roundup, and and. <laughs> And Roundup, um, I thought was all settled, but it took about an hour and a half. Um, different staff people talked about it, and, and it, it, there were people there that um, indicated that they've been uh, um, uh, sick as a result of Roundup in their yard and how the Roundup is used and, uh, and so forth. And anyway, um, what uh, is going on, that's going to be, uh, the roundup is going to be on the agenda at our next meeting, which is uh, March the 20th, next month. But the, in the meantime, staff, our staff um, has some areas where they're doing some testing of, of different chemicals, roundup included, on different kinds of plants. And, um, and so they're, planting these plants and, um, and treating with chemical at certain times. And this is a, a period that takes months to conduct because there's so many different chemicals that are available. And so um, it went, uh, we, and there were people in the audience that were really uh, upset. The room was, I think, filled in here, almost filled if not. And so uh, that really surprised me. but. We made a lot of good progress, and a lot of people walked out knowing that with this TETS program that's going on, we're going to uh, get a resolution here on whether or not we, we will be using Roundup. And that concludes my presentation.
presentation and the date of the next meeting I mentioned is, is March the 20th. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. That, that was a very long and very interesting meeting. March 20th is the next meeting and it will be here in this room. Okay. And so where we are now is um, future agenda items, none. And we are on director comments, and I will start with Director Tibbetts. I have nothing to add. Nothing. Thank you. Nothing. Okay. Thank you. Nice to be back. Oh, it's nice to have you back. Thanks, John. It's nice to have Bert back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's nice to have Bert back, and uh, the items being tested for the roundup is is mentioned extensively in the uh, February breeze. Just for people to know. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, wonderful meeting, and I'm so glad to see you back, Bert. And uh, breakfast is on, I mean, lunch is on me. No problem <laughs> at all. And uh, Ray's going to help us a little bit. But uh, a great meeting, and uh, glad everybody's here, and so thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, the only comment I would make is that your landscape meeting, it was mentioned that if you're worried about Roundup being sprayed on grass, that if you see grass, there's been no Roundup because Roundup would kill the grass. Mm -hmm. So that was good to know. For yeah, that was very good. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I've said enough. <laughs> good meeting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to give a sort of community service announcement. Um, Laguna Woods is serviced quite a bit by... Memorial Care, it's a program, a hospice program out of Saddleback Hospital, and they do both hospice and palliative care. And so they serve all of Orange County, and it's, it works a little bit like our Friendly Visitors Program out of the Social Services Office, and they're really in need of volunteers. And all it requires is two to four hours of your time to go and visit someone who's sh shut in and on either hospice or palliative care and either just sit with them or read to them or play a card game or something. And it's a very rewarding experience. It does require a little bit of training. Um, if anyone's interested in even getting more information, if you could call the Memorial Care um, Hospice Office at 949-452-3000, and they'll give you more information. And I'm hoping um, social services will be putting something out in our breeze I'll be getting together with Eileen. Thank you. Thank you. Director French. Director English. I said <laughs> French, say French. French, English, Croatian, whatever. <laughs> That's Chuck's name, isn't it? Oh, he's Holland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good meeting, and I'm glad to see Bert back. Thank you. Siobhan, did you want to say anything? Jeff, did you want to say anything? Okay. I do want to say something. This was an agenda with a variety of items on it, many, many items, and I really, um, I just really congratulate you, board, for getting together and working through this. And we really did, even though it seems late, we really did work through this quite quickly. Thank you so much. This meeting is recessed. <laughs>